Funny. Hello. Um, may I ask how do you pronounce your name? You can just call me Ani. Ani, okay. Um, I suppose, I guess, I guess. <laughs> Um, waiting a few minutes. Hi, Adita. You look under caffeinated. Oh yeah, I can. I can hear you now. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's such a problem. When I came to the office this morning, I figured you know, like I'll have nicer coffee. Yeah. And I found the coffee machine to be broken. Like. Oh, like... Okay. Okay. That's that. That's sad. Yeah. Might as well stay at home. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hi, I know. Hey, everyone. Hi, Noah. Um, oh, sorry. How are you? Hi. I'm doing well. Um, yeah. How How are things? Are you um, in in, in no. Alberta? Or? I I'm in Montreal. Actually, I am in Montreal. Yeah. Love how everyone is like in random place now. Like, <laughs> it, is, it is hard, yes. Uh, with the pandemic, everyone can work whatever he, they want. And it, it's been hard actually to stay in the same place and not move from there. Um, so currently I am a visiting researcher at Mila McGill. So I, although things are still like virtual, but I decided to move a little bit to another city to just, you know, change from the routine of just staying at the same place yeah somebody like randomly in the office earlier today was like telling me like all the crazy things they're doing and like you know, like there's no other time when you'll be have like the same level of flexibility so you might as well like use it to your yeah. advantage and do everything that you're thinking about like I, I don't understand why I'm not in Hawaii. Actually, I, I have a good reason why, why I'm not in Hawaii right now. But um, anyway, we can talk about it later. Yes, 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 definitely. I would rather be in Hawaii. That's for sure. I mean, I would too. But I mean, I think Canada here is putting more restrictions on travels and international travel. So we're we're sort of stuck a little bit for here. Well, Canada has reopened, yeah. Like, yeah, but yes, that's true. They reopened, but they put more restrictions or, on international students. And uh, I mean, even for international conferences, we can't really travel there. So this is from okay. university's restriction. Gotcha. Yeah. Hi, Hi Emily. Yeah. Nice to see you, Emily. How are you? Good. See some familiar faces. Hi, Peter. Uh, hi, Willie. It's great to see you. You're looking good. Thanks. <laughs> um, I'm thinking maybe wait a few more minutes before sharing my screen. Um, and but really, like the first ten minutes, I just wanted to kind of like uh, start like breaking the ice, I guess, because it's hard like when we're in a virtual meeting to for people to connect and actually like feel like they're engaged. So I, I like to start, you know, like just a soft start, I guess, like, um, I don't know what people have on, have on their mind, but um, maybe I, maybe let me ask the question of like, what are you, what are you most interested, like, why are you interested in, in conversational systems, I guess, uh, this is like a question to everyone, not just Peter, um, like if, like, why are you, why are you here, I guess. <laughs> Well, I can tell you, I'm here mainly to, to learn. I, I don't know a huge amount about conversational systems. Um, as I mentioned when I talked on, on Monday, um, I would love to see the standalone systems that can explain themselves develop into conversational systems where users can uh, have a discussion with the computer about what they're doing and uh, debug it and fix it when it makes mistakes because of its bad beliefs. So I'm just curious what other people are doing in this space. And I know it's a pretty big space, you know, ranging from 
you know, uh, chit chat to goal oriented dialogues and so on. So I'm just generally curious to see what's going on. Yeah. Any other takers? Uh, maybe maybe I can I can uh, say a few things about this. I I, I think uh, the the next well decade or so might might see conversational agents becoming the the new GUI of sorts, uh, a GUI which is dynamic and which keeps on evolving with time. Uh, hopefully, I mean uh, that that's the that's the dream, and I think it it would be nice to be at at a place where we watch how this evolution happens and knowing more about the research that's going on in direction in this direction like most of the things are pretty much in their infancy right now and therefore i'm, I'm i also share the same curiosity that peter is uh talking about about this field and how, how things evolve absolutely Um, well, yeah, least, what, what about what about you? What inspired you to uh, um, put this workshop together or co-organize co this? You know, a couple of years ago, like if you asked me, like about the whole like original system thing, like I was like, I'm not that interested. And then I started, like you know, use it using Google Home at at home, and you know, there's some like there's some more intelligence to be desired there. <laughs> So I like, I, I, find, I find it useful. Like it is like, as it is now, it's quite useful, uh, but there's a lot more that we can do with it. So I'm always like, you know, trying to connect what I'm like my work to like real life and how, how like real people will benefit from it on a daily basis. So that's, that's what keeps me inspired by this uh, domain. Um, yeah, I know. Have, go ahead. Oops. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say something about why I came today here and why I work on conversational AI. I think th th for the same reason, as you mentioned, uh, Walid, uh, I think we have systems that can actually perform and generate fluent and natural sounding sentences. But when you really listen carefully to the conversation, it doesn't make sense at the end. And um, I think what makes me really spend more time on this topic is that I'm just impressed on um, by us human how we can you know reason about different things understand the context remember things from the past you know understand common sense and I, I'm, I'm not sure how we can just transfer all that knowledge to um, you know dialogue systems it just so hard and I think we take that for granted um, and what actually impresses me more is that uh, language is filled with ambiguity so um, you know, we establish context from uh, using cues from the tone of the speaker, previous words that we have said, different experiences, you know, the basic knowledge about the, the, the word and all of that. Uh, but, you know, with the process of, I feel determining uh, context comes easily to us, but defining the same process in a computable way, um, it, I'm not sure how we can, you know, transfer that knowledge to 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 machines, and this is what we're trying to do, I think, um, through, you know, research and uh, yeah. One of the things, that, one of the aspects I like the most about uh, this area is like there's a bigger. It feels like there's a bigger human element in it uh, because like we're not treating text as this, you know, like object that nobody is actually like interacting with or like like it's it has it doesn't have a face but in a conversational setup like it is a conversation so you're actually thinking about the, the person or the system on the other end and how it's going to understand you or how it's going to respond to you this like human element uh in nlp i find to be also quite uh, interesting and motivating um let me share my slides. Um, I don't have actually like real slides here, but just something to, you know, um, for people to be looking at between 
presentation. Well, Lisa, we lost your sound. Um, it's telling me that I can't speak while also presenting. Can people see my screen still? Yes, we can. Yep. Okay. Yep. Uh, that is strange. So I'm going to. I'm changing the slide now. Can you see the new slide? No, we just see the slides preparation screen. Oh. Okay. Um, I mean, you can you can present just in the non-presentation mode if you like. Hello. Uh, yeah, I think this is working. Okay. Um, we don't see the slides in presentation mode, but we can see them in slide preparation mode. So we're, we can see slide three now. Okay, that's fine. Um, thank you. All right. Um, well, thank you for being here uh, and welcome to the workshop. Um, I would like to thank uh, the organizers who helped put this together and all the contributing uh, invited speakers and uh, lightning talk speakers. Um, the schedule uh, will start with lightning talks. We have three of them, followed by an invited talk by Scott Troy. Um, and I'll hand it over to, I believe Aditya is um, uh, introducing these. Right, right. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear okay, you. Cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Hi, I'm Aditya, and I would be hosting this first session of Lighting Talks. So we have three talks uh, lined up for this session. Um, I'll quickly go over the time format. So for each talk, we have six minutes for the presentation, and followed by four minutes for question answer. Also, we have a buffer of five minutes towards the end. So if we have any remaining questions, we can uh, take take that to the buffer. Uh, buffer time uh, towards the end. So yeah, so let's get started. Um, so our first talk uh, is on bringing the human in the loop for building a socio-culturally aware knowledge graph of the human agent. Uh, the talk is titled Get to Know Me, Creating Inclusive and Culturally Competent Conversational Agents by Jenna Thompson. Uh, so yeah, so let's get started. Uh, Jenna, can you present your slides? Yeah, uh, just a quick note. I'll give a heads up at one minute mark and a 30 second mark, uh, okay. which is I'll type in the chat. And yeah, that would, should be good enough. Okay, great. Uh, good morning, everyone, or good evening, good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, my name is Jana Thompson. I'm a research scientist at NYU and a graduate student at MICA. Um, this talk is titled Get to Know Me, Creating Inclusive and Culturally Competent Conversational Agents. First off, I'm going to I'm going to say straight out, most of this work is still proposed. We're just getting started with it. Um, our research to date is we started with just looking at how people use conversational agents with smart home assistants. Um, there's been previous work, but we wanted to do some uh, do some work of our own. So we did a five day diary study with six users. Um, and so we did had them record every single interaction they had. And one of our key insights we pulled out of this was that the systems had no understanding when they asked about non-American cultural artifacts. So people had asked for music. Uh, the quote at the bottom is a good example. My, uh, someone's husband was from Gujarat. There was a sing this Gujarati language singer they liked. Their Google Home had no idea what they're talking about. 
Uh, so we designed two novel features. We did, we have designed the front end. Uh, we titled these features, Get to Know Me. That's the name of the talk, which we run at Setup. And a second one called Add to Favorites. Uh, the, get to the, the Get to Know Me feature is designed to initialize a personalized knowledge graph for each user at Setup. And then the Add to Favorites feature is designed to update that personalized knowledge graph as per the framework of Amar and Shabad Nijad, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. So the large problem is obviously one language, one society does not equal one culture. Um, you know, everyone probably in this talk has lived somewhere else besides the country they were born in at some point in their life. I have most, almost all modern countries have immigration from other places. Um, so designing for one market, creating something for one society does not work. Um, it's a known problem with conversational agents certainly lack cultural competence. Um, you know, we really need to work at a more pluriversal world and we really need to build systems that really do understand more about where people live in their lives. And that's both a technical and a commercial a research and a commercial problem. Um, so knowledge graphs are a good potential solution. Uh, Springer and Kramer in 2018 started looking at this problem. They were both at Spotify. They gave a talk at AAAI Spring Symposium. AAAI Spring Symposium talking about how they use crowdsourcing for mapping. Um, some of these diverse terms, such things like there's this rapper called ASAP Rocky, but it's spelled A dollar sign A P. And that type of uh, that type of linguistic use is very creative, very common in the language and music and artists, but it doesn't map to ASR output. So that was one way they were talking about using crowdsourcing to try to get these to map to, to ASR output. Uh, knowledge bases and knowledge graphs uh, could be a model for what's called the poly, what, what Van Erpen de Boerd termed the poly voice, uh, looking at cultural artifacts, events, news from the multiple perspectives in a society or in the world as general. And the Wasabi database or, or data set is this large data set of 2 million songs with metadata. And Bufa et al. have been working on converting that into a knowledge graph that can be used. Um, larger ones need to be larger, more co comprehensive one or smaller ones, more specialized ones should be built as well. Uh, this is what we're looking at as a potential model architecture from Amar and Shaban Najad, who built a customized uh, conversational agent for clients of a ch of child welfare, uh, child welfare agency somewhere. Each client had a personalized knowledge graph based on a survey in their history. And this was fed. This system was also informed by knowledge bases on child welfare agencies and services available, health assessments, and other aspects of, of this particular milieu of problems, so that clients could get the information they needed in particular that was very personalized. Um, building at scale is also an issue. A lot of these research projects, I think um, are in Shaban Nijad are an exception rather than the rule tend to be really toy box examples. Um, there's a couple of papers that I have found about looking at it at scale for using ontology, you know, using specialized cultural ontologies in particular to feed into a cultural specialization, what they call culture specific as a box. This is from Grassi et al. 2021 that fed into the personalized knowledge space, the personalized person subject as a box. Um, I think some of the biggest challenges here, well, there's lots of challenges, but one is how to get all of these diverse types of names mapped specifically to things to instantiate in a knowledge graph. Uh, it, I think the best solution would probably be using snorkel and a crowdsourcing solution. Um, the artifacts in multiple languages which is a huge issue, would have to possibly be addressed in the same way to create um, a well-informed knowledge graph and scoping the KG, which um, one initial thought I've had on that, and I haven't really talked to Ali and Isabel about, is scoping it down to be more specialized by genre, by a geographical subregion, to kind of build a set of smaller sub-knowledge graphs that could be linked. Um, that's the entirety of my talk. Uh, if you have any questions, please contact me here or Isabel or Ali. Ali thank you.
thanks jana great talk uh, so yes yeah, so i think we have 4 minutes for the question answer um, uh, like do people have questions so i'd like to maybe uh, start with a quick question about um, so the extent to which we can use knowledge uh, knowledge bases for uh, like to supplement this uh, cultural component um, it seems like uh, my understanding of, of uh, the work so far um, focuses on like artifacts that are you know like common in in different cultures uh, there is a very different um, component of that like the way we speak english actually like the same language varies quite a bit between countries and um, even you know someone like who didn't speak english as a first language they would still learn english uh, in their home country and they would find like expressions i grew up in egypt and like uh, my partner is american and oftentimes i say something in english and she doesn't understand what i mean right because like it's a kind of english that's used in egypt so egyptian english or something if that's what we call it and uh, i wonder if you have any thoughts on um, how we could potentially uh, complement this by uh, you know like uh, also like address this aspect of uh, cultural diversity yeah so i didn't actually specifically talk to that um because that's not my not really something i've thought about i mean i've thought about it i've read up some and there has been some research on there is actually starting to be more research on diversity of English or diversity of, you know, certain languages in general. Uh, you know, the language we call Chinese is actually about 20 different languages, certainly big divisions like Cantonese and Mandarin. Um, so researchers have sorely neglected that. It basically left English to be, you speak American, standard American, or you speak standard British. Um, and, you know, that's not the way English gets used across the world. It's, you know, it's a language that's spoken in every country and it's got all of these very strong differentiations. Um, you know, like, I think, honestly, even thinking about the research, I know just that on what's used in smart home assistance, you know, India is probably the largest English speaking population in the world. They do not build smart home assistants that I've heard that use Indian English. I don't know how, and several of the subjects of our, in our research study uh, were immigrants to the US from India. And they did, uh, the, their, their speech was incomprehensible sometimes, their expressions or their accents. So this is an ongoing problem that definitely needs to be addressed. Um, that's the other side of the coin that I didn't address in this talk, that's a huge elephant in the room. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah, I had a quick question. So how much uh, world knowledge does a dialogue agent need to know to even start questioning and start developing this personal knowledge graph of the sociocultural artifacts? Um, do you mean how, what, how big does it need to be or how much of the scope? Uh, uh, yeah, the scope and general, like just, just to even question to build some knowledge graph of a user for a social, a social or cultural artifact, the dialogue agent itself should know some world knowledge to even question some deep, deep knowledge, right? Yeah, so the feature, this whole get to know me feature that's set up with a personalized knowledge graph, the idea is to get to learn something about the user, the individualized mm -hmm. user. Now, I mean, I've also, in our original, in other parts of the talk and stuff we put together, uh, there's definitely some concerns about um, privacy and settings. Right. So, you know, the user would have to agree to this. It's not just, okay, you're going to agree to this out of the box. But um you know, the whole idea is the future walks through conversation where it like gets to learn about a person, where they've lived, where they've grown up, um, right. you know, places they've just had expended time or even, you know, they're particular, it does ask like, what kinds of music do you like? You know, are there any geographical areas? Are there any genres you like? Right. No, I mean, what I mean is let's say if they give an answer, they live in India and there's a special social artifact for India. So the dialogue agent itself should have this world knowledge to even question in that particular direction. Once let the, let's say the user says India, uh, yeah. there is something more spell like the classical music, let's say more important in India. So they can, uh, the, would the agent specifically ask about something uh, related to India or would th this be a generic question? Um, so we haven't done like that specific of research, but yeah. I think in general, in the front end, you would want to develop something like that. Got it. Got it. Um, maybe not to ask, like the, it's, pro, it's not designed to ask very 
specific questions like that off the end, but you would definitely want to develop these paths where if someone said like, you know, um, they like this genre, it might ask specific questions or related genres like a recommendation system. I see. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I think we are running out of time. Let's move to the next talk. Okay. Thanks, thank thanks, John. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, our next talk is, um, uh, yeah, our second talk is on reducing factual hallucination in dialogue systems by refining the generated output. So the talk is titled uh, Neural Pathfinder. Uh, I think it will be presented by Noah. So yeah, go ahead. Um, do you see my screen? Yes. Um, okay, great. Um, yeah, so hi everyone. Nice to meet you all. My name is Noha Ziri. Um, I'm a PhD student at the University of Alberta and I'm currently um, a visiting researcher at Mila. Um, so in this presentation, I'll be talking about how we can reduce hallucination in knowledge graph grounded uh, dialogue systems. Um, and I walk you very briefly about our approach. Um, so existing dialogue system that we have currently are powered by large pre trained language models and they are able to generate very fluent text. Um, however, uh, while these models are, are very powerful uh, at certain tasks, it's well documented in the community that um, they, they have tons of problems. For example, uh, they can uh, they lack common sense about the word. For example, GPT-3 thinks that a pencil is heavier than a toaster. Uh, also, they lack consistency um, and they tend to generate uh, contradictory responses. Uh, for example, in the short dialogue, the chatbot contradicts itself by expressing um, first that they like superpowers and then they just uh, oppose themselves. Um, perhaps even a, a bigger worry with these models um, is the harm uh, that they may inflict on members of the society when they generate offensive sexist language, um, and this can perpetuate stereotypes and, you know, marginalized communities uh, get always get hit the hardest with, with these types of responses. Um, another issue is that these systems can intentionally or unintentionally generate hallucinated text. By hallucinated text, I mean factually incorrect uh, text. For example, GPT-2 here thinks that Justin Trudeau is the prime minister of the US, which is factually incorrect. Um, so, you know, factual incorrectness and truth are really, really hard. And once you start thinking about it, pretty much everything will be disputed. And so a model that, you know, just says anything about uh, you know, without any justification or without being conditioned on the important piece of knowledge will, will just be of limited use. Um, so nowadays we talk about grounding responses on different, uh, sorry, sorry, oops. Um, uh, we talk about grounding responses on different sorts of text. For, for the case of dialogue, we ground the response on the history, on grounded, on unstructured text, such as a Wikipedia document or a, a structured information, um, for example, a knowledge graph. So the issue is that even when conditioning the dialogue response on some knowledge from the graph, the generated responses are oftentimes hallucinated. If we consider the following example, we have a subgraph about uh, the director Jay Roach, um, and then the speaker says, do you know any good movies by Jay Roach? And the, the generated response, as you can see here, is uh, hallucinated. Uh, he didn't direct Titanic, and he didn't produce Meet the Parents. Um, so, as a, for, as a starting point for our investigation, we study the various types of hallucination a model may inject into a response. So specifically what we do is that we explore uh, the circumstances under which language models um, are likely to you know, exhibit unfaithful behavior. And we discover that hallucination can take form as either extrinsic or int intrinsic to the provided knowledge graph. Um, and this was also inspired by previous work. So extrinsic hallucination means Means that we bring new information, um, new text that does not correspond to a valid triple uh, in the knowledge graph. For intrinsic hallucination, um, now we mean that uh, the you know the utterance misuses two entities in the knowledge graph such that uh, there is no direct path in the in a, between the two entities. So uh, based on these findings, we propose Neural Path Hunter, uh, NPH for short, we use a, which uses uh, facts uh, that are supplied by a knowledge graph uh, to reduce a particular case of hallucination. And we focus mostly on entity-based hallucination. So uh, basically, this model will operate on hallucinated responses. So what we do is that we augment existing um, uh, dialogue system with an additional refinement stage uh, that focuses on fixing these hallucinations by 
querying uh, the right, the correct entities from the graph. So um, our experimental results show that NPH can reduce hallucinations by a very large margin, 40%, uh, according to human judgment, with a very marginal drop in fluency. Um, so before talking about the model, here's the task definition. So what we want to do is that we want to generate a response X given a dialogue history plus a set of triples. And these triples are either extracted from the knowledge graph or provided. Um, and the constraint here is that we want our response to be faithful to non-empty subset of these triples that we have. Um, so let's take a look here uh, at our um, uh, architecture. So uh, basically, NPH is composed of two module. Uh, the first one is called the hallucination critic. The uh, and the second one is the entity mentioned retriever. So uh, the hallucination critic, what it does, uh, it flags and masks out hallucinated entities um, in an existing response that we already generate. And then, um, uh, so basically we treat this problem as a sequence labeling task where a binary label will be predicted at each token to, pre to, to you know, tell whether it's hallucinated or not. And then the entity mentioned retriever uh, uses, um, you know, at first a pre-trained uh, mask language model to obtain the contextual representations of these tokens. Um, and then uh, these, uh, you know, representations are sequentially fed to a language model to obtain you know, output representation, which will be used um, to query the knowledge graph to, to get the right entity. Uh, and uh, to train the entity mentioned retriever, we here we augment our conventional maximum likelihood objective function with an additional a contrastive loss um, to, to encourage you know, faithful uh, retriever. Um, so we trained several baselines and we applied NPH on top of them. And um, you know you can see the results here in the table and we can see that NPH uh, constantly performs favorably um, in reducing hallucination across um, uh, FICA metric and critic. FICA is a question answering based uh, metric known to be very effective uh, in measuring faithfulness in uh, the, the task of summarization. Um, uh, yeah, and blue score here was not really helpful in detecting whether there is hallucination or not. As you can, blue just measure the lexical overlap between the generated response and the ground truth. Um, so yeah, the take home message here is that um, you know I think of these existing uh, neural dialogue systems as a proof of concept, and that we are able to you know generate natural looking sentences, but we're very far from solving many issues as these language models are plagued with biases, hallucinations, offensive of offensive language, and you know even the hallucination problem is very very hard, and the improvement that I talked about um, you know I just talked about. It happened by identifying two important modes of hallucination, uh, which when accounted for, you know, led to this, um, you know, uh, nice reduction in uh, in hallucination. But we hypothesize that, you know, further gains can be made uh, when accounting for other types of hallucination beyond entity correction. Um, and this is basically what we're trying to focus on um, in the future. Um, I think that's it. Thank you. Uh, great, uh, great talk, Noah. Uh Thanks. I think we are uh, like two minutes over time, but that's fine. Uh, yeah, I had actually two quick questions. So one is, how does this compare to a model, let's say, where instead of generating the exact entity, we are generating, let's say, entity type, which is some ultra fine grade entity type. Let's say we are generating movie. Like instead of generating the exact movie, we are just generating a, a placeholder token of movie actor or something like that. And then we are just, so we can just remove the critic component that we do not need to know which which tokens to mask we just know that okay these are some placeholder tokens and then we can directly query the knowledge graph to fill that mask placeholders so what i mean is in the first step of generation we are not generating entities as such we are just generating placeholders yeah yeah i see your point uh yeah good question so basically here you can think of uh what we're doing is that with the refinement stage we just you know have a template response that we mask we mask out the the wrong entities so um actually when just generating a template where we don't generate really just the placeholders for the entities um i don't think that's the um, very good approach because um I mean, to, to save time, we, we just rely on these powerful language models to generate right answers. And in mo most of the cases, not all the entities will be hallucinated, right? So I think if what we I do see, is, I see, I see. you see my point? So if you're just, right. 
it will increase the error there and we would end up maybe with more hallucination rather than fixing hallucination. So this is why we focus on detecting first if there are any hallucinated entities. If there is not, we don't have to refine anything. If there is, we, we go ahead and, and do the refinement. Uh, yeah, and the second one is uh, why not we directly use the knowledge graph we are querying during generation itself. Uh, like when we're generating, we condition it on the question or the previous dialogue plus the knowledge graph triplets so that the knowledge is injected in input. Yeah, so basically uh, at generation time, we condition on the knowledge graph, but the problem, okay. yeah, we, we do uh, condition on that even oh, okay. when, when con we condition, we, we still the model generates uh, wrong entities. Got it, got it, great. Yeah, um, sorry, um, uh, any other questions? I just had a quick question. So if your knowledge graph is incomplete, um, it's hard to tell whether something the model generates is a hallucination or it's just using its uh, pre-trained common sense knowledge. Um, do you have any thoughts how you might distinguish the two? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, actually. Uh, we know very well that existing knowledge graph are incomplete, and this is a very active, you know, um, a research area where like researchers try to complete and to you know add more entities into uh, the graphs so what we assume in our work we assume that we have um you know a big enough knowledge graph that we're able to query and to retrieve the correct entities we have one millions of entities and i think 100 k of relations um but but i mean we rely on a classifier that we trained separately and this classifier was trained on you know 100k um you know uh utterances and you know, errors can happen uh, uh, the our classifier is not 100 percent accurate so and it did it doesn't know where, where i mean sometimes an entity is correct but it doesn't appear in the knowledge graph so for sure the model will assume that this is a hallucinated entity so we would end up with these cases um so yeah uh, but i mean in, in an ideal case in an ideal world we would have a model that knows you know everything in the existing word and we have an existing uh, a complete knowledge graph uh, but we don't have that and i think this is we talk about this a lot in the paper that these errors can happen and we can end up with cases where you know this entity doesn't exist in the knowledge graph but the model doesn't see it and assume it's wrong so yeah but i mean these cases are rare because we assume that we have a big enough knowledge graph so Awesome. Uh, yeah, I think uh, we can now move to the third talk because again we are running out of time. But great talk, Noah. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, I, think I just wanted to point sorry. out that uh, there's a raised hand. Sure. Yeah. 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 Uh, so for any questions uh, after the talk, uh, uh, it would be better if the participants can raise hand for asking the question. Yeah, that would be great. Cool. Um, yeah. So our third talk is on injecting world knowledge using adapters in LMs to get a retrieval pre knowledge grounded dialogue agent. Uh, I, um, so it will be presented by Jan. Jan, can you share your slides? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, the talk is titled Retrieval Free Knowledge Grounded Dialogue Response Generation with Adapters. Yeah, so hello. So can you see my slides? Oh, yeah. So Oh, yeah, so yes, hello everyone. My name is Xuan and I'm from I'm a PhD student in Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Uh, today I'm going to present my uh, recent work, Retrieval Free Knowledge Grounded Dialogue Response Generation. A uh, knowledge grounded dialogue task is aiming to enrich contents uh, of the generated response with knowledge. Existing work utilize knowledge retrieval to augment the generation process. Uh, despite its great success in achieving promising uh, performances on this task, this retrieval-based approach has drawbacks on its efficiency. Recently, large pre-trained language models have been shown to have the capability of carrying uh, implicit knowledge, which brings up a new research direction. Whether it is, in, uh, it is possible if we bypass the retrieval step and use the knowledge in um, stored inside the pre-trained language model. So like in this work, we propose and retrieval-free 
framework, a uh, null expert, to inject the knowledge corpus into the parameter of pre-trained language model and leverage the learned knowledge for dialogue generation. So in the model, we insert lightweight adapters upon each GB2 layer, which acts as knowledge experts for certain topics. Then we generate a response with mixture of knowledge experts whose ways are determined based on the relevance to the topic. So our training process follows a three-step uh, paradigm. Uh, first, so we train the contextualized topic model using knowledge corpus and cluster the knowledge sentences into the corpus, uh, in the corpus based on the topics. Second, we train different topic specific knowledge adapters, uh, knowledge experts with knowledge sentences in different clusters while freezing GPT-2 back, uh, backbone to reduce the discrepancy between knowledge experts and the uh, knowledge experts training and the, the later task adaptation. We convert the knowledge sentences into pseudo conversation style in the data pre-processing. So third and lastly, for task adaptation, for task adaptation, we fine tune the backbone GPT-2 model with a pre-trained, uh, with the pre-trained knowledge experts use, uh, using the target dialogue data sets. So in this step, the parameters of the knowledge experts are kept and trained. So finally, we, uh, uh, we evaluate the performance uh, of the model on um, result of Wikipedia, CMU doc data set with both automatic metric and the human evaluation. So from the table, the results indicates that uh, our proposed model uh, performs uh, comparably with the retrieval based approaches, especially on single main. Our, our model even outperforms some retrieval based baselines. Also, uh, no experts succeed to generate more informative responses compared with the GP2 baseline. We also evaluate the response generation inference time of our proposed model and two other inference uh, retrieval based baselines. From this plot, we can observe that our proposed method requires the least end-to-end -end inference computing time. Also, it could keep it could keeps the constant cost regardless of the size of the knowledge corpus. So at the end, in conclusion, we propose not expert the first retrieval free framework for knowledge grounded dialogue task. Mm. Uh, sorry, our method can generate more knowledgeable responses without, expli uh, without explicit retrieval step compared to our baseline model. By bypassing the retrieval step over the knowledge corpus, the inference efficiency of the model is improved. Also, experimental result uh, shows that like our model like uh, actually outperforms uh, uh, comparably with some retrieve based retrieval based method and it's actually very exciting like this demonstrate the potential of our proposed di uh, direction so thank you guys for listening if you are interested please check our full paper uh, for more detail and any question is welcome thank you mm, thanks and uh, great great talk I think I'll just get started with one question which I had uh, when I read the paper, great paper as well. So um, I think we uh, you do this when a pseudo conversation style pre, uh, training, right? Mm, and yes. it's done on the Wikipedia corpus, right? Uh, yes. So my question here is that generally these LMs are already pre-trained on Wikipedia. So, and we are doing this mm. pseudo pre-style training on Wikipedia. So how mm. would this model compare to a model in which we just increase the model capacity by the number of parameters you have introduced in adapters. So what I mean is, uh, can, we, can, can we create a bigger model without adapters and just use the standard Wikipedia pre-training? Would it be good at capturing this knowledge which we are capturing via this Wikipedia pseudo uh, conversation pre-training? Uh, so basically here, I wanna, uh, yeah, so basically for GPU model, it's not pre-trained on Wikipedia articles, like from their like training paper. Actually right, right. here, I'm, I'm, yeah. I mean, what I mean is uh, given an LM which yes. is pre-trained uh, pre on Wikipedia. Yeah. 
Ah, yes, yes, yes. So yeah. I think this is this is actually possible. But what I wanna uh, explore is like uh, how to keep the like how to like keep the model size as small as possible, but effectively uh, like find in a way to use the uh, parameters in the model like more efficiently. Of course, I think uh, if we kind of enlarge the model size, for example, we use GPT-3 and uh, right. of course, I think it's very possible that it's already, of course, it's pre-trained on Wikipedia already. And uh, right. from the performance of the GPT-3 model, we have, we, uh, I think we are very confident that it could achieve good scores but for me for my perspective like always going to large models of course is good it's actually provide really convincing and exciting result but um, right. no, my I mean focus is, yeah. do you think it is better to have this model inductive bias of having adapters versus just blindly adding th those parameters into a model uh, I, I mean what i mean is maybe this architecture is useful uh, even if we consider a large model on wikipedia yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, uh, I, uh, for me, I, I think so, cause it's like for a large pre-trained language model is already pre-trained on so many data and right. we actually don't know how to trigger the knowledge out, out. So for me, it's better to have some more either uh, fine tuning or either, I think recently there are also a lot of paper about prompting. It's better to kind of give the model this kind of bias to trigger the like the specific knowledge to make it more useful. Yeah. So I think this we have my... a lot of other, qu other questions from other people. Let's just take those questions. Yeah, sure. Uh, I think we have a raised hand. Yeah, uh, I don't. Okay, anyway, who who has it? Can... Hey, I have a raised hand, and um, if you want to yes. see who has the raised hand, if you go to the participants tab, a little hand icon shows up. Next got it, to got it. So Emily has a raised hand. Now I can see. Uh, yeah. So uh, thank you. One question I had is that um, for the retrieval based approaches, um, sometimes one of the advantages given is these um, updating of potentially outdated or new information. So like Nuha gave the example of, um, you know, uh, who's the president, Barack Obama, and then that might, uh, mm -hmm. information might become stale. So did you either do any evaluations on one of these data sets that has, you know, information that might change over time? Or um, do you have thoughts of when new information comes in, which parts of your um, model would you need to update to incorporate this? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your question. It's actually uh, something like I, it's also my concern to this kind of approach. It's like, because this uh, uh, pre-trained model is already pre-trained with some like already crawled like data and those are not well updated. So for me, for my perspective, uh, like from like, I didn't really test on those data, but it's true like if, uh, we choose the wrong knowledge expert, uh, then the models start to hallucinate as the last presenter uh, present the problem. Yeah, it's actually uh, increase the hallucination if the if the model doesn't train on the uh, needed knowledge. So this is actually a problem. But I think at the same time also uh, currently like there are more pre-trained language models coming and. Uh, I think for uh, the coverage is already large. Yeah, of course. So for the knowledge we already included inside the language model, we can consider like we can consider it this way to kind of crop the language model or like do fine tuning to this direction. But for those new data, like from my perspective, of course, is some it's also some drawback of my proposed model. And for me, we can think about the hybrid way if like those really new topic uh, comes out. Yes, uh, I hope I answered this question well. Yeah, thanks. So any other questions? Mm, I don't see any raised hand, uh, but yeah, if there are any other questions we have, let's say three more minutes. 
school. I think we don't have any more questions. Uh, uh, handing over this to Walid. Uh, I think uh, we we are done with the lightning talk for the first session of it. Yeah, so the next portion of the program will be an invited talk by um, Scott Roy, if you want to start getting set up with your with your slides. Um, so it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Scott Roy, who's a um, senior researcher and engineering lead at, at Waymo, actually. Um, and prior to Waymo, uh, he worked at Google, where he worked on um, problems in uh, uh, generation, including data text generation and open domain chatbots and work very relevant to this workshop um, and problems of trans, uh, machine translation as well. And then prior to that, um, he led a core project at uh, Yahoo um, for personalizing the content on the Yahoo homepage. Um, so today he'll be talking to us about using um, machine uh, translation within uh, task-oriented uh, generation output. So thank you. <clears throat> All right, thank you, Emily. Let me see if I can share my screen successfully here. All right, are people able to see that title slide? I see a thumbs up. All right, it'd be tremendous uh, you know, if you can to turn on your videos. I know we're kind of a small group, and it's always nice to actually see people's uh, faces. So uh, you know, if you're not in a position where you can turn on your video, I understand, but uh, it's always great to see people. So yeah, thank you for doing that. All right, so thank you, Emily. So my name is uh, Scott. As Emily said, I currently work at Waymo on uh, self-driving cars, but what I'm going to talk to you about today is actually work that we did over the last few years at, at Google, uh, looking at how we could use machine translation to localize uh, task-oriented NLG output. So before we dive into that, I just wanted to give a you know, shout out to the, the tremendous team of people that helped to work on this over, you know, over the years, including me here, Cal, right, who uh, helped to organize this workshop and who invited me to talk today. So uh, me here, thank you for uh, you know, your contributions to the project and thank you for inviting me to speak today. And there you can see there's a link to a full paper that describes everything I'm gonna talk about today. All right, so what do we mean by task-oriented NLG? So essentially we mean any kind of application where the user either speaks or types in natural language, and then the system responds in natural language, right? So here I've shown the typical kind of pipeline that you'd see for uh, a dialogue agent you know, type application like the Google Assistant or Siri or Alexa, where the user will say something like, what's the weather like? And then there's a speech recognition component uh, that goes from speech to text, the language understanding piece that turns that into some semantic interpretation. Uh, this gets sent to fulfillment systems, and then the output of that goes to a language generation box that produces natural language text. And then finally, if it's a spoken system, this will go to a TTS system to actually turn it into speech. And right, we'll say something like it's currently 78 degrees in Mountain View. Um, so our particular focus is on that NLG box of you know, looking at kind of the output half of what we do. Uh, it's worth pointing out that there is an equally interesting, possibly even more interesting problem on the input side of using machine translation uh, to help with the NLU, but um, our particular focus was on, on the NLG box. All right, so if we drill into that a little bit more, this is the, the problem that we're looking to solve. So the information that we get from the fulfillment systems is structured data of some sort. Right? And so here, um, I've kind of shown that as just a list of key value pairs. Uh, we you know, organize all the things we want to say by domains, so things like you know, weather, or sports, or timers, and then intents within that domain. So here it's a current temperature one. Um, you can see that the, you know, the values can be strings, they can be enum values, they can be numbers, they can be booleans. Um, so fairly uh, powerful, but also simple representation. Um, since we're working on the localization problem, we also assume that we have access to an English system that can give us an English rendering of this content. So you can see there down at the bottom, it's currently 25 degrees in the Cayman Islands. And then our goal is to take the combination of the structured data and the English text in some target language and produce something like the German sentence that you see there on the right. So, and by the way, feel free to jump in with questions at any point. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to answer questions as, as we go. Um, so there's a few interesting things to point out about the problem in this form, right? So the first is that um, we have a, a defined schema. Right, so we may have dozens of intents, we may have uh, dozens of uh, domains you know, for those intents, um, but 
at the end, every intent has a fairly defined schema of the argument keys that we actually expect to see. Um, you know, some of those may be optional, but it's not an open domain problem where uh, you know the type of structured data we look at is, is unknown ahead of time, right? We know all the, the different field names that we're likely to see. Um, the second is that there's actually useful information in both the structured data and in the English that's not available in the other part of the representation. So we really need to use both. So for example, if we look at the English, uh, you can see that you know, we've chosen to ignore a lot of the things that are actually in the structured data, right? So it says nothing about the humidity. It says nothing about uh, you know, the temperature unit being Celsius as opposed to Fahrenheit. Uh, you know, there's nothing about the date other than you know, just it's currently today. Um, even more, you know, the English may actually be doing some interesting logic to convert this structured information to a more presentable form. So for example, if we change the intent and it wasn't today's temperature, but it was something like the temperature on this particular date, right? Then the output would have to be something like it will be 25 degrees on Thursday in the Cayman Islands, right? And somehow we have to go from that date string, you know, 2019-0717 to a day of the week, Thursday. Um, that's very easy to do with, with code algorithmically, um, but it's actually very hard for a machine learning model to actually learn how to do something like that. Um, so by looking at the English, a lot of these planning decisions about what to say and a lot of these algorithmic decisions about how to convert it into the form we want um, have already been made. Right? And that was a lot of the motivation for really treating this as a machine translation problem. Um, it's worth seeing though, there's actually information in the structured data that you can't get from the English. So in the structured data, you can see here that we're able to include things like a localized name for the location uh, so Cayman insulin um, that's not available in the English at all. And so you can imagine that if the only thing we looked at was the English, um, you know, then the machine translation system, it needs to memorize uh, translations for potentially an open-ended list of entities, right? So even though, uh, you know, kind of the field names and such come from a finite schema, you know, typically the values are, is a very open domain problem. Um, and so that would be much harder for it than just being able to look at uh, this localized string in the input and, and copying it over. Um, and so because of that, we actually have a system that, that tries to really take advantage of, of both pieces of information. Um, I've called out on the right there that our focus in doing this was really looking at some low resource languages in India. Uh, so these are languages like Marathi and Bengali that uh, are spoken by hundreds of millions of people um, and that we'd like to be able to support with these kinds of applications. And it was actually quite hard for us to uh, take some of the existing ways that Google would localize our output uh, and make them work in those languages because it's hard to get linguists and you know the other kinds of skilled professionals who would need to actually do that. And that was a lot of the motivation for looking at using machine translation. So I have a question before you move on. Yeah, um, yeah so um, besides these two types of information and how they're complementary, are you also conditioning on the original um, input text um, that was that's in the lower resource language? Um, <laughs> Because at least in human dialogue, there's sometimes things like, you know, entrainment and you might sort of match the way things are phrased, even though they're kind of equivalent yeah. to the structured data side or the English side. Yeah. So uh, the answer is that we're not looking at that explicitly, but it may be included as part of the structured data. Right. So okay. sometimes in the structured data, the system will pass through context information um, that tells us, you know, particular things about the dialogue state and what it was that the user said. And we can do that for doing things like, Exactly, you know, replying in the same type of manner or form that the, the user uh, the user used. Thanks. <clears throat> All right, so here's here's the design of the system. This is the training part of it. And we'll talk about serving at the very end, uh, time permitting. Um, so you can see that the the main piece of it is this machine translation box in the middle. But both because there's extra information in the structured data that a machine translation model is not going to have access to, and because the machine translation model itself is somewhat big and slow, uh, we actually use it offline to generate training targets that we then distill into a, a data to text model that we can use at serving. So uh, the flow you can see there from left to right, uh, the solid lines is the, you know, the training flow where we generate uh, lots of synthetic examples in this you know, kind of structured domain using the schema information. We run those through the English system, we then translate them, and then we train the data to text serving model to go directly from the structured data uh, to that translated output. Um, and I'll talk at the very end how it is that we make sure that that data to text model can take advantage of uh, information that's actually in the English uh, text itself. And so at serving time, you see the dotted line flows. We actually, uh, we don't use the machine translation model there. Right? We just take the structured data, we run it through the English system. Uh, you'll see again, we, we extract some additional features from the English 
and that's what we actually feed to the to the survey model. All right, so you can see there's actually two different models here. And I'll spend the rest of the talk, I'll talk first about the machine translation model and kind of how that works. And then I'll talk about the data tech survey model. Um, if we have time, I'll actually also talk about how we generate the structured data. It's kind of an interesting part of the problem. Um, and then wrap up with a few thoughts on you know, future directions of where this work is going. All right, so the translation model. So uh, the idea seems nice, but as you start to drill into it, you, you quickly realize that machine translation is actually a very poor fit for this kind of problem. And the reason is shown here. So machine translation really excels on open domain problems where coverage is extremely important and quality is much less important, right? So you think about something like using Google Translate to translate a web page. Um, you know, typically it's not crucial that everything is translated perfectly, but it's, it's usually quite nice that it can actually give you some best guess at everything, right? And that'll give you some sense of what the page as a whole is actually about. Um, our problem is almost the exact opposite of that, right? So you know, we don't actually need to translate everything. In fact, the range of things we really need to translate is incredibly small, right? So if you look at, you know, again, dozens of domains and you know, dozens of intents within each domain and, you know, maybe a few different, you know, variants of how we want to phrase things uh, for each intent, you multiply that all together and you still only have, you know, a few thousands of basic sentences uh, that you need to translate. And it may, it may still be quite hard to do that in an accurate grammatical way because the grammar of the target language may be very complicated and uh, trying to inflect it correctly for all the, you know, the dynamic values that you're substituting in may be quite hard. Um, but the basic sentences, is, it's actually very narrow. And that's what I've shown with these blue vertical uh, stripes. Um, and along with that, the quality bar we need to reach is typically extremely high. Right? So you can imagine that for something like uh, the Google Assistant or Siri or Alexa, you know, when it says something that's not grammatical, yeah, it's just terrible. Right? It's, a, it's a horrible user experience and you know, we just look silly. And even worse is if it makes an accuracy error. Right? So uh, you know, it says something that's just factually incorrect. Um, it, it's really bad. Um, and so we have this combination of a very narrow uh, you know, range of things we need to be able to translate in a very high quality bar. And you know, fortunately that combination is, is one that uh, is feasible that we can actually achieve. All right, so if we're gonna hit that quality bar, you know, this is, you know, the kinds of errors that we actually see a generic machine translation model make that we need to fix. And, you know, we can see these by actually running a baseline machine translation model on uh, sentences in our target, you know, application and looking at the kinds of mistakes it makes and then categorizing them. And that's, that's kind of what we've done here. So here I've shown the examples in English. Uh, so you can have a sense of what kinds of errors are, but you can imagine these in some uh, target language, and especially a language you don't speak. So this is actually one of the real challenges of working on this kind of problem is. Uh, you're often dealing with languages that uh, you know, no one in your team actually speaks. So uh, there's grammar mistakes. So instead of it is 72 and sunny, we say something like it are 72 and sunny. Uh, there's places where the machine translation model just uh, picks a poor translation. So this often happens when words have multiple senses and it just, it, it picks the wrong word sense and it translates it into the target language using a word uh, that makes no sense at all in the current context. So here you can see I've used this weird circumlocution to, to try to illustrate that kind of problem of Translating sunny is no precipitation in the atmosphere. There's a lot of problems where entities get translated literally. Um, you know, this typically happens because the model, you know, the machine translation model doesn't realize it's actually looking at an entity. And so it'll just translate the words in the entity literally. So translating mountain to pinnacle and view to, to vista. And then finally, there are just basic accuracy errors. And these have gone down over the last few years. This is the models have gotten better and better, but uh, you still see them occasionally. Um, and here I've shown one where we've kind of transposed the digits in 72 and inverted the sense of the sentence, right? So you know, changing the sunny to rainy, which uh, is easy to happen if you know you, you know, drop a function word like not, right? It can really just invert the whole meaning of the sentence um, in a bad way. So what we've done is, you know, after categorizing the errors like this, is we've come up with particular approaches to fix each of these problems, and that's that's what I'll describe next. All right. So the first are grammar mistakes. So the basic idea for how we fix grammar mistakes is that we show the model hundreds of millions of examples of grammatical sentences. And what's going to happen when we do that is it's going to build an extremely strong language model of the target language that really makes it quite hard for it to produce ungrammatical sentences. Right? So you can imagine that if the translation model you know, sees hundreds of millions of examples of grammatical sentences, if it never sees an ungrammatical sentence, um, it actually has no idea what an ungrammatical sentence even looks like, and it's, it's actually just very hard for it to produce it. Um, 
So where do we get those? So uh, fortunately, at a place like Google, it's very easy to get endless numbers of sentences from the web. Um, and so that's what we do. And we need to make sure they're high quality sentences, because otherwise we're just going to be training the model to uh, produce ungrammatical sentences. And so we have a simple scoring technique we've come up with that uh, tends to promote uh, you know, high quality sentences that look grammatical uh, with high scores, and then uh, you know, sentences like you see there at the bottom that um, are not very grammatical uh, with low scores. And then we can just draw you know, some pruning threshold, throw out everything below that, and end up with uh, hundreds of millions of, of sentences that are uh, by and large quite grammatical and that, that help the model fix these grammar mistakes. Now, here's how we do the scoring. So the scoring idea is that we're going to get a corpus of sentences that we know are high quality. Right? So we take those from things like articles and blogs and Wikipedia pages. Right? And we, we know they're high quality and we know they actually look kind of like the sentences that we want our system to produce. And then we're going to build a similarity comparison model that is going to take an arbitrary sentence from the web and it's going to ask, OK, does this sentence look like it came from our high quality corpus? Or does it look like the rest of the sentences that we've seen from the web? Um, there's many different models you can imagine you know, using for this. I and mean, this is itself a very interesting discrimination task. But uh, we found for what we needed that a very simple Bayesian classifier actually worked just fine. So uh, what the classifier looks at here, you can see there in the lower right are uh, unigram and bigram word features. And you can imagine, especially with like the bigram word features, that when you see some pair of words that just does not really occur in grammatical sentences, um, it's a strong signal this is a sentence that we don't want to use. The formula itself is a log odds ratio. So this is one I've actually had great success with in this kind of application um, and in others when you need to score things based on uh, categorical features of some sort. All right, so the second quality problem uh, that we need to address is just poor translations, right? And so here, the, the basic approach is the same one that the machine translation community in general looks at when they're trying to uh, you know, fine tune models for a particular domain, which is uh, you collect new translations uh, that fix those problems, right? And so here you can see I, I've kind of organized the sentences again by domain and intent. And what we do is we just collect you know one or two or three sentences, uh, you know example sentences for each of these, and we translate them into the target language. And the reason why we don't actually need a lot of these sentences is twofold. Right, so one is that most of the places where we actually see translation errors with you know, words and phrases, it's not in the, the dynamic values that we're substituting in. Right? It's really in the more kind of static boilerplate parts of the sentences that we're trying to produce, where it just you know, the, the translation model mingles out. And so even with just kind of one example of, of how to translate uh, you know, that part of the sentence correctly, you know, the model is going to pick up on what to do. Um, the second reason is that even though we only have, you know, say, a few thousand of these sentences, we can really magnify their effect uh, using this technique I've kind of described at the bottom there called contrasted data selection um, that lets us find similar sentences in, in the vastly larger pool of web sentences that we have. Um, and that's going to let us really magnify the impact of each of these sentences. So here's how contrasted data selection works. Um, you start with uh, a base machine translation model that does not include these fine tuning sentences. Right? So these you know, 1,000 or 2,000 high quality sentences that we've collected. Um, we train that, and that's, that's model M. And then we're going to fine tune for a single step using the high quality sentences that we've collected. Um, and this is intuitively going to move the model uh, just a little bit closer towards a model that really reflects the high quality sentences that we have. All right, and now what we're going to be able to do is we're going to be able to use both those models uh, to compare all of the original training sentences and we can look at which one of those had their probability go up with this fine tuning and which ones had their probability go down. And the intuition here is if the probability went up, it means that the original training pair looks similar to the fine tuning sentences. And moreover, it looks like it's probably a reasonable translation. And so that'd be a good sentence for us to you know, focus on when we do additional fine tuning. And conversely, if that probability went down, it means that this sentence looks very dissimilar to the fine tuning data. You know, it might even be an error of some sort. And so we should you know, try not to look at that so much. And so we score all the sentences by this difference. And we use that as a weighting when we do the full fine tuning. And the effect of this is to magnify you know, kind of the impact of you know, this very small number of sentences uh, in the hundreds of millions of sentences that we're able to collect from the web. Right, the third problem is this problem of uh, entity translations, right? And you know, how we make sure that the model is not translating entities in some literal fashion. And uh, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, the main reason this happens is because the model doesn't actually know when it's looking at an entity. 
And so we can fix that by just actually marking spans of text in the input English text that correspond to entities. Yeah, I see a question there, Willie. Um, yeah, so um, actually it's about the previous slide. Um, so when you do the contrasted data selection um, approach, how much of the data do you find to be uh, like relevant or like closer to uh, like more likely to uh, um, to, to, to have a good uh, probability with the M star? Yeah, it's it's a great question and I don't actually know. I, I'm kind of wishing now that we produced some histograms that actually showed like the score distribution um, and we never did that. So that's actually a great question, something I'd love to follow up on. Okay, so once you do that, you like you only train, you only like continue training on those, on this subset. Yeah, I, exactly. So I mean, you could imagine just, you know, setting some a pruning threshold and then only doing the fine tuning with the things over that, that threshold. Um, what we actually do is we actually, in the loss function, when we do the fine tuning, we actually weight each sentence uh, based on its score. So things that have a high score, you know, get a weight of one, things that have a very low score effectively get a weight of zero. And so they get they get pruned out. So that makes a more kind of sliding, uh, sliding scale. But, and you do this once or do you continue doing this like, uh, like every few uh, batches or every talk? Yeah, we right now we only do this once. It's another good question. I mean, we we've looked at more iterative approaches where you would recompute these scores, you know, after doing you know some number of fine tuning steps. Um, we we didn't get far enough to see whether or not that would have a strong impact. I mean, you'll see when we look at our results is that you know largely we got to the point where the the quality of the model was um, as good as we needed for what we were doing, and so we we didn't focus at that point quite as much uh, on the quality experiments and how we might improve the quality, and we focused more on some of the production issues of uh, actually trying to make this work in a production system. So awesome. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So back to the entity translation errors. All right. So um, so the basic idea is just if we can identify the spans of text in the English input that correspond to entities, then when the translation model sees them, it will know their entities and it will uh, you know hopefully learn you know correctly whether it should uh, translating it. So things like locations, you often do have a localized name. Uh, more often entities, you just want to either transliterate um, or just copy. Um, just a hey, check to make sure people are still hearing me since it looks like everyone's videos are frozen. I hear you fine. You, you hear us, okay, great, great. sounds good. All right, so um, in order for this technique to work, we need to be able to introduce those annotations at both training time and at inference time. Um, so at training time, you know, since the sentences that we're using as training data are just arbitrary sentences, you know, a lot of them come from the web, uh, we use a named entity recognition system that can actually, you know, detect entity uh, mentions in arbitrary sentences. And again, happily at Google, uh, you know, we have access to a very high quality named entity recognition system. At inference time, we, we could use that same named entity recognizer, but uh, it's actually even more effective. We can use uh, span annotations that come directly from the English NLG system, right? So typically when the English system is generating these sentences, it, it knows which spans of text correspond to entities. And so it can put in those span annotations, at, you know, essentially 100% um, precision. Um, to make sure that these two things are somewhat aligned, uh, since at inference time we have very high precision labels, we actually run the NER system in a very high precision way uh, to make sure that when it's adding these uh, span annotations that they really do correspond to entities. Um, and it's it's just fine if it misses some of them. Um, you know, the, the main goal is just to make sure that when it puts those in that the system knows it's looking at an entity and handles it correctly. And then finally, the last problem we faced was how to fix the accuracy errors. Um, so here, you know, a comment is that when we trace the source of these, um, invariably what we found is that they all go back to errors in the training data. Right, that if you see an accuracy error of some sort, you, you, you know, we could inevitably find uh, lots of examples in the training data that showed that same problem. And when we would eliminate those poor sentences, uh, then that particular accuracy error would go away. So the way we tried to tackle that in a more generic way was to build a classifier that could detect these accuracy errors. And then we could run it over all the machine translation training data and use that to uh, filter out anything that looked like it was a mistake. And that, that would kind of fix them all in one, one fell swoop. So the way we, we train that classifier is to actually use the same training data that we use from the machine translation model itself, right? So I, I mentioned that there's accuracy errors in there, but by and large, it's, it's mostly accurate. And so if we assume that any random sentence we pick is accurate, 
Um, we can actually use that training pair as a positive example for this classifier. And so that's what you see with, you know, kind of the target language part of this uh, slide and then the first English sentence there, which is an accurate translation of that. So that comes from the original training data and we assume that that's accurate. Um, we're going to treat that as a positive example. To create negative examples, then what we're going to do is we're going to change the English text. So we're going to change, you know, things like the entities or the dates. Uh, and because we're making a change, if we assume the original was a correct translation, then we know that the change sentence is not a correct uh, translation. So these give us the negative pairs. And so that's how we're going to construct both positive and negative examples to train a classifier. Here's a, a little more details about how we uh, construct those negative examples. So we go through the English part of all the training sentences and we uh, look at the part of speech pattern uh, for the word and its immediate siblings to the left and right. So you can see for the word addition uh, that the word to the left is an adjective number and to the right we see the end of sentence marker. And what we do is we uh, look at all the words that occur with this pattern in the whole training set. That's the table you see there on the right. So for example, uh, you might see you know, third birthday or third century or third reunion. Those are all kinds of things that would occur in these sentences. And so we just change the word addition randomly with one of these words. Um, and this is going to produce a new sentence that is hopefully reasonably grammatical, um, but is not actually a good translation of the original uh, Marathi text that we have, or the Hindi text in this case that we have there. All right, so those are the, the four basic techniques. Let's look at the model itself. Um, there's actually two models here that I described, right? So one is uh, the machine translation model itself. The other is this accuracy error detection model. Uh, we actually ended up using the same architecture for both of them, right? So it turns out the accuracy error detection problem is similar enough to the machine translation problem. It's actually quite helpful to be able to warm start from a machine translation model and, and use exactly the same model. So you can see that the second bullet from the bottom is a, you know, basically the way we use that is to treat it as a, a you know, generative translation problem. So the input is the English, then some separator, and then the, the target language text. And then the output is just the word correct or incorrect uh, to indicate whether it, it seems like an accuracy error or not. So our model is the BNMT model that Google has published you know, various papers about. Um, the input side of this is a transformer encoder. Uh, the output is an RNN model that uses an attention mechanism to look at uh, the outputs from the encoder at every time step. In terms of data size, you know, we have about 10 million uh, natural parallel sentences in the particular languages we were looking at, and these come from uh, Google Translate. Um, we have you know, several uh, hundred million sentences that uh, we get from the web and that you know, have passed our scoring filters and we can use in this uh, back translation approach to improve the grammar. And then we have a very small number of high quality sentences uh, that we get in domain uh, human translations to fix the poor translation problems. All right, so that's that's the basic model. All right, so let me then show some results of uh, how this actually does. So uh, just a quick word on these results. So um, they're not as uh, you know kind of robust of evaluations as I would like to ideally do. We we found it was actually quite hard for us to evaluate this because uh, we did not have access to lots of real examples uh, from blogs for the particular problem we were looking at. And so we actually used a lot of synthetic data for doing the evals. And we discovered this is actually a real problem for human raters. So, uh, you know, human raters you know, often get confused by these synthetic examples when they're not uh, realistic enough. Um, so I'll show you the evals we have, which are, are quite positive, but you know, know that we, did, we were not always able to do the kinds of apples to apples comparisons I'd like to do. And uh, this is definitely an area for, for future work. All right, so first is the accuracy error detection model. Um, so here there were two different ways that we uh, evaluated, so two different eval sets we looked at. So one was a set of in-domain sentences um, that we had had translated by human translators, but because of the particular uh, you know, use that those sentences were constructed for, for our purpose, they actually, a lot of them had accuracy errors. Right? So about a quarter of them actually had accuracy errors. Um, so here when we you know, ran the trained accuracy error detection model on this, uh, and we found we could achieve 100% recall, meaning it would find all the accuracy errors that were there and only misidentify you know, about 4% of the, the actual correct sentences as errors. And so that, that was pretty good. So then we ran a second experiment where we looked at 5,000 web sentences that uh, we had also had translated with human translators. And th these we ensured from the instructions that there would be uh, no accuracy errors in those translations. So any, anything that the model identified as an error here would actually be an error in the model. So those would all be precision errors. Uh, but here we can see it, you know, it's, it still was able to pass about 90% of the sentences uh, through and thought that they were good. 
And so for our, our purposes, this is just fine, right? Because we have you know, again, hundreds of millions of sentences and it's just fine if we throw away you know, 10% of those because we're not sure if they contain accuracy errors or not. Um, our real goal is just to make sure that we find all the things that really are errors and we get rid of those. I um, mean, so we want to run it in this very high recall mode. All right, for evaluating the machine translation model, um, there's a few different evaluations we did. So the first one is automatic metrics that we can compute. So just you know, blue score comparisons against human translations. Uh, so here you can see some results using uh, 900 synthetic examples where uh, the examples use values that were not part of the fine tuning data. Um, we want to make sure there's no overlap there. And in addition, about a third of the examples, we actually use novel intents that we didn't have any fine tuning data for. And about a third were even harder where they came from completely new domains that were not part of that fine tuning data. Um, and here you can see very good improvements you know, across, across the board, which was uh, you know, quite nice to see. Now it's hard to understand what blue scores might mean. So the next eval we did is on a, a similar, but you know, slightly different eval set. We actually uh, had humans rate all these translations that our model produce in three different aspects of so grammar uh, and naturalness. So how natural is this in relative to what a human would say and is it accurate? Um, and the grammar and naturalness scores are on a five point scale where one would mean that it was a horrible sentence and a five would mean it was you know, perfectly grammatical or perfectly natural. And here again, you can actually see very nice improvements um, across the board. So this, this was also quite nice. Um, the thing that's hard to know looking at this is what the headroom is, right? So it's hard to know whether you know, like a 4.53 grammar score is good or not. So the last evals we did, we're actually looking at human translations and seeing what the kind of baseline numbers would be for human translations. And so here we were at this point able to get some real examples from blogs. So, uh, so we, in addition to kind of the same uh, 600 synthetic examples you know, we used from the, the previous one, we also pulled out uh, you know, a bunch of real examples from blogs. And unfortunately, we, we were not able to actually use uh, the same examples for the human evals as for the, uh, the NMT evals. Um, so again, it's not quite an apples to apples comparison, but uh, the main takeaway we had from this is that we were, we were definitely in the same ballpark as what we were seeing for human translations. And uh, uh, me here actually is a native Marathi speaker. And so he actually drilled into these Marathi examples in great detail. And you know, came away with a clear conclusion that uh, you know, to the best of our ability to tell with you know, kind of our imperfect eval process, uh, the sentences we were producing really were uh, you know, just as good as the sentences that human translators would, would produce. So this was this was you know, very much at the quality bar that we were uh, looking to achieve. All right, any questions before I go on to the data text model? And I'll I'll move through this section I think a bit faster because you know, I'm seeing that we're uh, you know, only have about 10 minutes left or so in the, the presentation. I guess just to make sure uh, I understand how everything fits together so far, uh, the yeah. translation component, the improved one, will give you uh, plenty of examples for the component that you will explain next to train on. Yes. And then on the error detection uh, uh, component, will exclude some of these translations. You'll just throw them out because you don't want um, like uh, erron erroneous problem, erroneous uh, data for training this next component, correct? Uh, that, that's partially correct. So there's actually two different places. Uh, there's actually a, a few different places we can use that error detection model. Um, so one of them is, is the one you mentioned, is that you know, once we run things through our machine translation model, we can use the accuracy error uh, detection model to filter out anything that looks like a bad translation. We actually use it a little further upstream on the, the training data for the machine translation model itself. Um, you know, mostly because we, we found that that was largely sufficient to get rid of the accuracy errors that we were seeing um, in the output. And so we, we could apply it to that output as well, but it, it would likely not uh, really identify many additional errors beyond what was in the, the training data. So the error detection output feeds into the machine translation, the customized machine translation model. Yes. Yeah. So we would use that to actually uh, you know, basically filter errors from the machine translation training data itself. Got it. Done. Thank you. And you will, you will see actually at the very end, we, we also used it to evaluate the, uh, the quality of the final data to text model, right? So there we could also run the accuracy error detection model uh, to look at problems there. Um, you'll see those metrics at the, the very end. Any other questions right now? All right, so let me try to go through this part a little bit more quickly. Um, so, our data to text model is uh, basically an RNN decoder. Um, so this actually it was one of the oldest parts of the, the system that we built. It actually predates uh, the transform model. 
Um, and it's, it's kind of interesting to see the ways it's similar to a transformer model and the ways in which it's not. Um, but we never ended up updating it to a transformer model because we found that this actually worked uh, just fine for what we needed. And um, yeah, so we'll look at those results in a bit. So, so the way it works is you have an RNN. Uh, this is the parts that are there in green. And at every time step, we use a, an attention mechanism. So actually the same attention mechanism as a, as a transform model to look at an encoded version of the structured data. Um, and we feed that to the RNN cell together with the previous symbol. And then we simply decode the text uh, one symbol at a time. All right, so the main interesting part then is how we encode the structured data. And so this is uh, showing that. So on the left, I've shown the particular example here that we're encoding. This is a you know, movie reservation uh, example. And the way to, to see the encoding is that we basically take the values that are in this. You know, so putting aside the field names for a moment, we take the values and each symbol in the values corresponds to a row. And we just kind of go down from the top. So you can see uh, the very first row is that you know, number of tickets you know, that's the string symbol four. Uh, and then we have the theater, so century 16 on the next uh, 10 rows or so, and so many all the way down. You can see the, the domain enum and the intent enum are near the bottom. Those don't have symbols. I'll explain in a moment how it is that we encode that information, but uh, this is the basic layout, right? So we're just gonna kind of take the raw, uh, you know, string text of the structured data the way it's printed here, and we're gonna create one row for each symbol. The columns then actually encode where that symbol comes from, and this is what the model is gonna use to actually look up uh, that information and figure out what it's looking at. So uh, the token number column is uh, simply the sentence piece uh, token index of the symbol. So uh, you know, we use a sentence piece model for this. And for those enums you see at the bottom, uh, because these enums come from a fixed schema, right? we know all the possible enum values, these are just the index values of those, those enum values. Um, the argument number is uh, how we actually get access to the field names, right? these key names. So uh, if you remember way back in the beginning, I said there's a, a fixed scheme of these, so we can assign an index number to each one of those. So uh, num tickets apparently is you know, index number four, and you know, num slots down at the bottom is index number 32. Um, the third column is type information. So there's uh, various kinds of numbers or strings or booleans, enums. So uh, we record that here. And then the fourth column is position information. So we know for each symbol uh, where it came from in the particular field. So you can see, for example, for uh, the theater name, Century 16, uh, that these just count from zero up to you know 10 uh, to give us the position information. So the actual data tensor is those four columns of numbers. And we turn this into something that the model can look at by converting it to embedding. So uh, we just do an embedding lookup for each of these index values in a large embedding matrix. We concatenate the embeddings for each of the four columns. And then we do some projection to project that down to a smaller space and break it into uh, a query you know key and value so that uh, in the attention mechanism, the model can produce a query at every time step. We use a scaled dot product attention to compare that to the keys. Uh, we do a softmax over all the different rows of this table, and then we return kind of a weighted value based on that, that softmax. So very, very similar to uh, you know, the way a transformer attention mechanism would work. The model architecture itself, so we found that even just a very simple model uh, works quite well for this task. So uh, here you can see you know, the model parameters, it's quite small. Uh, we experimented with you know, many variations of this, you know, trying to beef up the model with you know, more layers or more hidden units or more read heads. And we added things like you know, transformer tile, uh, self-attention. And we found that all those things help a little bit, but uh, none of them helped sufficiently that it really made sense for us to use a more complicated architecture than this. Um, so this is, this is what we settled on. And here, here are kind of the results. So this is a distilled model, right? So the goal is really to uh, you know, figure out it, you know, ideally for it to replicate exactly what the actual translation model uh, would do if we were using the translation model itself. So uh, we actually evaluate in two ways. So the first is just looking at English sentences, right? So if we're getting the translation model at all, we can use this to try to go from the structured data to the English output. And this is quite helpful just to make sure that the raw input has enough information uh, that's a doable problem. You know, here, you know, what we see is uh, you know, essentially 100% match against you know, the English references that we're trying to model. Uh, the places where it was not actually an exact match, it, it turns out are not actually errors in the model, but errors in the English NLG system. Right? So this was actually able to identify uh, various places where that English NLG system you know, had a few mistakes in the, the logic it was using and wasn't always producing the best, the best of sentences. On the translated side, we also, the main metric we would look at is just exact match against the NMT outputs. 
Um, and you know, here, again, we see very, very good results, especially on the synthetic examples, which are you know, in the same distribution as what we're using to train this. Uh, performance goes down slightly on the real examples, uh, but it's still uh, up in the quality range we want, right? So the actual quality is, is probably slightly higher than this you know, 95 to 97% number because uh, oftentimes we would see perfectly good translations. They, they just happen for this example not to match uh, the reference ones that the, the machine translation model is producing. And overall, you know, this was exactly what we were hoping, right? It was something that would actually produce uh, high quality output in a way that was quite performance, so a very low link so that we could actually use in our application. Right, any questions about that? If not, I think I'm going to kind of skip this last section just in the interest of time uh, and kind of go right to uh, you know, a couple things here at the end. So, so, so one thing I do want to say is you know, how it is that we bring in information from the English uh, and make sure that the, the data to text model that we're using to serve that can actually use that. And, uh, so there the approach, if you remember, our NLG system was able to mark spans of text that corresponded to uh, arguments. And so we take advantage of that to uh, look at these annotated spans that correspond to arguments. We pull those out as additional structured data arguments. So here you can imagine, in addition to uh, you know, kind of whatever the weather information would be for this example, we pull out something that said time colon Thursday. Um, and this is how we're able to take advantage of the fact that the English system can compute things like days of weeks for dates. Uh, so the model doesn't need to do it itself. And in fact, you know, th these English span features are you know, almost sufficient for the model to do everything. You can almost get rid of the original structured data entirely, uh, but you can't quite, because as we saw at the beginning, there is information that that's not in English. So things like the localized names of the entities. Um, and so we find that the combination is actually uh, what gives us the best overall performance. All right, and then finally, let me just close by talking about kind of where this would go. So it, it's a little complicated, right? Because we have these two different models. Um, it'd be really nice if we could actually just merge them uh, into a single unified model. And so this is kind of showing you know, the, the plan for how we would do that, which is uh, that we basically treat it as a translation problem. But instead of just translating plain text, what we tra translate is a span annotated English text. Right, where the span annotations are things that we're actually able to get uh, from the English NLG system. And this is quite nice, because if we look at the structured data, uh, you know, some of the information in the structured data corresponds directly to these spans. So for example, those localized entity names, and we can include that just directly in the span annotation. So here, for example, you see that the name of France, you know, Frankreich in German, uh, we would just include that directly with the span annotation. Uh, but in addition, we can also give these kind of structured data pairs that are information that, that doesn't naturally align with anything in the English text. So for example, uh, the style of the output, or you know, things like the, excuse me, the gender of the speaker, uh, which would impact you know, what you need to say when you're actually addressing, addressing a person. Um, on the output side, I've shown another technique that we looked at, which is to allow the model, um, if it wants to, to actually use these placeholders in the output. Right? It, it doesn't always do this, but it, it essentially does this whenever it decides that what it really wants to do is just copy a value directly from one of these span annotations. So in this case, it wants to copy the word Frankreich and just substitute it in here. And since it, it knows that that's what it wants to do is it wants to make a literal copy, it can use this as a shorthand to uh, help reduce copying errors and to make the overall decoding a little bit faster. Um, it's worth pointing out in doing this, it, it, it still has access to the actual value it's gonna put in there as part of the input. And so it's able to inflect the surrounding sentence correctly and it's also able to know if it, if it can't actually copy this you know, directly because, you know, for example, you might be in a language uh, where the entity name itself needs to be inflected uh, based on how it's being used in the sentence. And in that case, it would not use this kind of copy operation. It would actually put in uh, you know, the fully inflected entity there. Um, so this is where we're going. And I'm you know, kind of hopeful that we'll uh, get a chance to build this someday. But, uh, you know, that would be a, you know, a team back at, at Google or, or perhaps one of you, you folks. Um, you know, as I'm, I'm kind of currently at Wemo, kind of looking at uh, you know, a very different part of the AI problem space. So, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it's been a pleasure to get to present here today. And uh, if you know, there's any time, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions that other people have. Uh, one question is, um... Uh, maybe this is this might have been in one of the things you skipped is can you say anything about how you um, synthetically generated the structured data? Yeah, let me go back there real quick just so you can see a little bit of that. Um, 
Yeah, so because we have access to the schema, you know, the basic idea is quite simple, is that we just, we look at the schema, we look at each argument type, and we just generate random values for that argument. So here you can see, uh, like in a weather example, generating a random location, a random temperature, and a random condition. Um, and that would produce sentences like this. The semantic annotation column, though, is actually quite important. So it's quite important that you actually know um, what things you're putting in, um, because otherwise you'll end up with, with skew between the things you're training on and the things you actually see. So uh, th this is actually quite an interesting example. So um, if you imagine like in a timer uh, domain where the input is just a single numeric value, which is the length of the timer in seconds, you'll see lots of training sentences like the one on the top, right? Okay, setting a timer for one hour, five minutes and 37 seconds. Um, but users never actually ask you to set a timer for some strange value like that, right? They're, they're always gonna ask uh, to set something for a round number of minutes or hours. And if you're just generating a training example that uses a random number of seconds, um, you'll find that only like about one in a thousand examples looks like uh, that one on the bottom. And so the model gets very good at generating output like the sentences at the top, but it could actually make mistakes on the much rarer examples like you have on the bottom. So these semantic annotations are actually uh, quite helpful to tell the model how to generate those synthetic values. So it actually aligns with the distribution you expect to see at inference time. So for this particular example, we would annotate that particular field as a user supplied number of seconds. And we would know because of that, that we should actually oversample uh, values that were even multiples of minutes or hours. Yeah, good question. I think uh, several people have asked questions throughout the talk uh, to kind of like, uh, given that you were um, kindly allowed it. It's always nicer to be able to like ask the question once you have it instead of like uh, yeah. waiting. I, for, uh, oh, that, was, that was great. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, the talk, Scott. And um, I mean, I, I would love to follow up with you later about uh, to ask about more details, but I'm sure we can talk about them externally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, feel, feel free. I mean, you saw my my email address there is just you know, hsrwaymo.com. So, uh, you know, feel free any of you to you know just kind of you know, shoot me an email. I'd be happy to uh, you know kind of discuss you know, discuss these ideas a bit more. Awesome. Uh, right, we're gonna take um, a twenty five minute break, and we will continue um, at ten a.m. I will keep this Zoom uh, meeting running, and um, we'll take it then. Thank you, Mike.
I hope everyone got a quick break. Um, I was able to snag a cup of coffee. I think CM is going to is trying to uh, get his audio to work, and then he will be leading the session. Okay, just just making sure. Uh, am I audible? And is the slide visible? Okay. Yeah. Yes, I can. I can hear you. Okay. Uh, let's wait for maybe thirty more seconds, and then we can start. All right, uh, I guess we can get started. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, hope you had a nice break. Uh, in this session, we are going to have another round of lightning talks, and then we'll have uh, another invited talk um, towards the end. All right, uh, so let's let's get started with the lightning talks. Uh, the first uh, presenter is going to be Sai Muralidhar Jayanti. And uh, the talk is going to be about evaluating pre-trained transformer language models uh, for entity linking in task-oriented dialogues. Uh, Sai, uh, feel free to start presenting and uh, start the presentation when, when you are ready. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, is my voice audible? Yes. Uh, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Uh, just a Uh, hey, uh, can you guys hear me? Uh, for some reason, my Zoom got uh, kicked me out. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we can hear you, uh, but uh, I, I don't think the screen share is uh, working. Have, have you shared the screen yet? Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah. Yep, uh, sorry for that. Mm. Yeah, so let me go ahead and start my presentation. So, hello everyone. So today I'll be presenting <clears throat> Uh, a quick a brief uh, introduction to this topic of evaluating pre-trained transformer models for entity linking in task-oriented dialogue. So let me start off with giving a generic introduction to what entity linking is. So it's essentially linking an entity object, which could be in the form of reform text or a tabular information to uh, a canonical entry, which resides in your knowledge base or data directory. So, uh, here is a quick example of how entity linking happens in dialogue systems. Uh, when a user prompts an input and the natural language understanding machine uh, processes that input, it basically produces an entity, uh, which generally is the named entity recognition process. And once we get this entity, the entity recognizer or the entity resolver uh, basically tries to identify what is the right canonical uh, entity that matches to the user's input. Uh, and use us that in the further discussion in the conversation. So uh, one of the main use cases of like, uh, like one of the main ways in which entity linking is used in dialogue systems is through free form entity linking, where you have like the text in a free form <coughs> manner rather than in a tabular manner. So here is how a uh, knowledge base looks like. On the left is uh, a, a huge record of your knowledge uh, 
uh, knowledge base objects on the right you have like an example of how an object can look like uh, it's essentially uh, something that contains a lot of metadata along with a canonical name uh, here in this example the seaweed salad is an example of canonical entity name which is again in a uh, textual format rather than in a uh, tabular format uh, for the sake of uh, uh, analyzing how different pretend models work on this this uh, kind of entity linking process, uh, we did some analysis and came out with this bunch of five different categories for entity linking. Uh, so on the right column, rightmost column, you can see the different categories named as semantic, numeric, abbreviations, phonetic, and syntactic. So I, I'll also take you through some of these examples in the upcoming slides, but. Uh, for the sake of analysis, we segregated uh, the generic entity linking process into these five different categories. Uh, so the one of the main challenges in this entity linking process is that the entities uh, that appear to happen in the freeform text can be referred in various different ways. Like not all people can refer the entity in the same way uh, as shown in some of the examples here. And furthermore, they can be more domain specific. Like for example, if you're talking to a chatbot which uh, helps you in a medical assistance scenario, uh, your entity should be uh, your entity linker should be more uh, oriented towards understanding medical terms. So th they are sometimes domain specific, and uh, more or less when users type text, there could be a lot of mistakes that can happen, and uh, henceforth ent entities can also be noisy or incomplete. Uh, and lastly, the main challenge, the other main challenge being that the knowledge bases can generally keep increasing in size. So that's one of the reasons why some of the modeling techniques are not uh, very easy to, uh, easy to be productionized. So uh, talking about the modeling techniques, then uh, we have like some traditional techniques which don't require like huge amounts of training data. Some of them being like the BM25 algorithm or like the TFID of vectorization. Uh, and more recently, people have been uh, using pre-trained uh, word embedding models like Globe or FastX to uh, obtain representations for these entities. Uh, and once we have some kind of training data, we could definitely use uh, more deep learning, uh, deep learning like neural networks based techniques. Uh, but at the same time, some of these techniques, like for example, classification uh, objective could be challenging when your knowledge bases are generally increasing. So in our work, we take a very generic path where we assume that the knowledge bases might keep increasing in size over time. So we go forward with the matching objective, uh, which uh, we outline here. So what we consider is that uh, our matching objective is pretty simple. It's question similarity based uh, matching. So you have a canonical entry in your knowledge base and you have the users uh, inputted entity, what happens is that you take representations for both of them and try to find the question similarity. So that is the metric by which you score all your uh, canonical entries and then return the top scored entry. So in our analysis, we use the pre-trained models as well as like the TFID of vectorizer with this question similarity representation. Uh, for the sake of analysis, uh, because there are like a lot of pre-trained models these days and uh, a lot of fine-tuned models as well, we again segregated these models into like four different categories for the sake of uh, a overview of these models. The first one is like the uh, BERT and Roberta based models. Uh, and the second type are like the smaller versions of these models, which are either distilled or created due to a different uh, training process, such as like distilled BERT and Roberta. And then there are like some models which are fine tuned for semantic similarity task. Uh, the reason why we choose semantic similarity task is that it's one of the closest ones to entity linking process. So uh, that's the reason we have taken some of the state of art models from sentence transformers library. And lastly, we also try some quantized models of these uh, best performing models to see if that actually uh, changes the results or not. With respect to data sets, uh, of course, there aren't like many uh, off the shelf data sets that we could directly repurpose or Test, test these models on. So what we did was we repurposed some of the existing question answer type data sets uh, by identifying some of the answer aliases in the examples. Uh, we created some sort of data sets which are uh, useful for the process of entity, entity linking. At the same time, we also uh, 
reuse some data sets from our uh, mind meld platform itself in the form of blueprints these uh, these data sets are basically human annotated and then we also had some uh, in house data sets which are obtained from asr mistranscriptions of person names so all in all these uh, data sets uh, contain uh, checkbox all the five different categories that we want to evaluate on so here are some examples uh, from these data sets and how the data sets look like on the leftmost you can see a question answer data set where there is uh, one answer and it has a lot of aliases so we essentially try to repurpose these aliases as our test queries and the answer as our uh, canonical entry and similarly in other data sets we have like this uh, entries which could be used as our test queries uh, so we repurpose most of the data sets uh, in this format and uh, what we finally obtain is this uh, different combinations of data sets with like different distributions uh, one of the some of the data sets are like in orders of thousands but some of them in like orders of tens or hundreds so it's an interesting uh, distribution of data sets we felt now uh, coming to the evaluation uh, again we took a simple approach of like doing the pressure at the rate 1 and 5 as a revaluation metric uh, and we used Uh, all the models for uh, all the models that visualized from the hugging face transformers repository itself so here is a quick glance of the results from all the, from from our experiments so as you can see uh, we tried with all this bunch of models and what we observed was that on an average uh, the models that were fine tuned on the semantic simulated task generally tend to outperform other pre trained models and at the same time they drastically outperform the baseline models uh it it's important to note that this baseline models are something that that are still popular in the literature as well as in the as well as in the industry practices as of today so uh, it would be great that if you could replace uh this baseline models with this pre trained transformer models so we also went ahead and tried to see if uh, how how good are these pre trained models for the spell checking task uh, I, i mean uh, for the task of uh, entity linking when there are spelling mistakes in your entities so we curated a, a data sets of uh, mistakes using this new spell library and what we obtained was again this uh, pre trained models have been performing superior to the baseline models by a large margin which again is a positive uh, connotation uh, we went further ahead and like we tried to uh, do a fine grained analysis by splitting the entire training set into like different this different chunk of uh data sets where uh, we are quite sure that each data set contains only of that particular type like for example when we say the semantic uh, category um, sorry, sorry to interrupt sai uh, can you speed up the presentation i think we are uh, somewhat over time here sure yeah uh, so uh, as you can see like we created this uh, subsets of data sets on which we want to evaluate and once again we kind of did this analysis on all these models and again we observed that on most of this uh, models like most of these data sets the pre trained models again outperform uh, so we went ahead and did some error analysis like what are the scenarios where these pre trained models are actually doing some mistakes uh, and some of them look like very interesting with respect to like the semantic similarity or the factual mistakes that the models are doing so uh, th th some of this could be definitely improved by doing uh, domain specific uh, fine tuning uh, which we plan to do as our next step so all in all what we observe is that these pretend models are definitely already quite compatible in a zero shot manner to do entity linking and they outperform most of the baselines but still there is a lot of uh, room for improvement on this large data sets that we saw and uh, as an extra we plan to like do some some kind of fine tuning and try to see if this could improve the downstream performance yep uh, that's it from me uh, thank you thank you sai uh, we have uh, two minutes for audience questions sure yeah anyone wants to uh, ask a question okay i'll i'll i'll, I'll uh, get get us started so uh, sai uh, in the data sets that you describe how many of them have uh, situations where the entity the identity of the entity is spread across uh, multiple terms in a dialog uh, so most of the data sets uh, didn't really come out from a multi turn dialog data sets so they are mostly uh, single turn dialogs 
so in essence they're not like some kind of coreference resolution it's mostly like uh, in a single dialogue you have an entity you mention and you want to resolve it to a canonical name so uh, yeah from that point like yeah none of these are actually some multi tenant dialogue data sets uh if no one else is asking a question i'll, I'll ask another one more, one more question uh so uh, did did you assume that uh, the the spans of the entities were already uh, provided at test time or are, are you also doing end to end entity uh, detection yeah well? for the sake of this experimentation we assumed that we have like 100% accuracy on the ner task so yeah which might not be always possible but yeah got it any any questions from the audience okay uh, i guess in the interest of time we we can move to the next lightning talk thanks. so thanks thanks sai for for the presentation next uh, we have wolfgang meyer and uh, the the name of the lightning talk uh, is challenges for conversational entity dialog model, modeling wolfgang if you can start hello <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yes, we can hear you. Good. Great. All right. So, hello, good morning, and uh, good evening. Uh, I'm Wolfgang Meyer. I'm with the Mercedes-Benz uh, Speech Technology Research Group in Germany. I'm presenting our ongoing work about the challenges for the conversational entity dialogue model. This is a joint work with my colleague Stefan Ultis. So let's dive uh, right into it. So we know that uh, usually modular spoken dialogue systems are built around task domains, uh, such as hotel booking or restaurant reservation as you can see in the example on the, on the right hand side. In such systems, uh, all the information that belongs to a certain topic is uh, encapsulated in a dedicated section of the dialogue states. So given the resulting flat dialogue states, it's uh, hard to actually model particular objects in relations between them. But it is easy to find examples where we would need to do that, such as uh, I am looking for a restaurant and a hotel in the same area. So here the user actually establishes an equals relation between the area attribute of uh, the hotel and the restaurant. Uh, the first to actually provide a principal solution for this uh, issue where Stefan and colleagues in their 2018 paper introducing the conversational entity dialogue model. This uh, CEDM introduces uh, so-called conversational entities. They exist in the context of, uh, that exist in context of uh, the current conversation. They are either conversational objects or they can be conversational relations. Both of them reside in a conversational world. The, Conversational objects are typed entities with attributes. They may or may not map to real world objects or they may be mapped to real world objects during an ongoing conversation. The conversational relations are relations between conversational objects or relations between their attributes. In the example on the right hand side, you can actually see the two types, hotel and restaurant together with the attributes, so name, area, food, stars, and so on. And you can also see two conversational objects, which are instances of the types, as well as the, the red conversational relation uh, relating the area attributes uh, of the objects. So every conversational object then contains a user goal belief and a context state. That means a user goal belief is the system belief of what the user actually wants based on the user input. And the context state models information the system actually has shared with the user. So the principal idea behind the CEDM is to model in this way exactly what the user is talking about. What we present here is uh, 
number of cases that uh, uh, push the boundaries of the CEDM. Uh, so we, we are currently working on an extension of the original model uh, to cover those cases. The main challenge is how in a conversation where we have actually multiple objects available, we can access a subset of those objects. Here, uh, the first variant is uh, the scenario where you refer back to a subset of objects using another object that stands in a semantic relation with them. So this is the case for the term outerware in the example you see. Uh, the original CDM has uh, flat types, as we've seen uh, earlier. So there's no direct way of actually modeling the which is a conversation object introduced by a user and the corresponding clothing items. So here, uh, what we propose is to introduce a conversational relation between types on top of the relations uh, which are already there between the attributes. It's uh, relatively easy to come up with more complex examples where no semantic relation is involved, uh, but other kinds of grouping expressions. So uh, here in the first example, uh, you can see uh, the expression too boring. Uh, which would need to rely on some kind of user model to be resolved. When additionally combining it with above the waistline, um, you need yet another source of knowledge to resolve what that means. Yeah? So which subset of uh, objects. In the second example, um, uh, so resolving more pockets would depend on knowledge about which uh, clothing items actually have pockets or maybe even uh, as well on uh, user uh, knowledge concerning the preferences. So the grouping of the items, however, can be modeled similarly to uh, the semantic relations. So finally, uh, talk, it's clear that also talking about the count of objects is an important challenge, uh, which is not, uh, considered in the original CEDM. Uh, this uh, can be seen in a conversation such as the one uh, you, you see here, which uh, this conversation is about booking a trip for multiple participants. So also the count here could be modeled as a conversational object by itself. Now going uh, beyond uh, the actual objects and looking at relations, we uh, see that in the CEDM, in the original one, the relations are, relations are binary. So also as seen in the example before, but it's also easy to come up with examples uh, which uh, cannot be handled with binary relations. So in the context of our closing example, we can uh, produce an example with an entry relation uh, here uh, concerning the color of items where uh, here multiple clothing items are uh, connected through the entry equals relation on their color attribute. Now last the uh, relation types uh, also need to be extended uh, in, uh, to, in towards more complex relation types such as temporal spatial relations. Um, here you have examples for both one for a temporal relation where the, uh, which relates the taxi with the train in a particular order and the cup with the bottle uh, spatially. Yeah. Quick summary. So uh, what we've seen is for particular complex configurations of objects in a conversation, the, we've seen that uh, the conversational entity dialogue model needs to be extended. And that is what we are currently actually working on. That's it. Uh, thank you. Happy to hear your questions. Thanks. Thanks, Wolfgang. Uh, I guess we have another minute or so for questions. So any audience questions? Um, I have a question. So, how do you like what data set do you use to come up with 
the like this ontology which you need to extend right like i'm assuming that you looked at a few examples and noticed that the uh, existing system was limiting so what is this uh, data set which you're looking at ah uh, this is uh, actually coming out of our uh, own considerations uh, uh, with uh, data we have uh, we have uh, worked on on our uh, own system so at uh, at uh, mercedes so that is not based on a concrete uh, knowledge source okay. i'm just i'm just curious is this based on like um, interactions of users in uh, in a car or is it uh, outside the no no setting? it's outside the automobile setting it's a uh, generic consideration which is not limited to our setting yeah cool thanks all right uh, i guess we can move to the the last and uh, and the final uh, lightning talk today um, we have rui zhang uh, presenting feta qa uh, free from table question answering rui uh, feel free to uh, start sharing your screen and yes so yeah, thanks. Can you can you see my screen for for slide? Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. So. Okay. So, yeah. So hi everyone. My name is Ray. And today I'm going to uh, uh, talk about FIDA QA for open domain, uh, free form table question answering. So it is a collaboration among Yale, uh, Hong Kong University, uh, Penn State, and and Salesforce. Can, can you see my slides moving? Yes. Okay. Um, so question answering aims to produce answers to natural language questions based on knowledge resources. And we can categorize the word of QA based on these uh, three elements. So first there are different knowledge resources such as unstructured tests, knowledge graphs, uh, tables, and uh, relational databases, multimodal inputs, and common sense knowledge. For different natural language questions, most data sets focus on answerable, factoid, and single term questions, while only a few papers investigate unanswerable, ambiguous, explanatory, and conversational questions. Finally, most current tasks produce short form answers. They can be extractive spans over inputs or even multiple choices and yes or no answers. However, only a few papers or datasets generate answers that are abstractive and long form in an open domain setting. In particular, for our work, we focus on table-based question answering. For example, Given these tables describing tennis matches, ranking, and players, a user can ask which European countries have players who won the Australia Open at least three times. A common approach is to do semantic parsing. So we take the query and the table schema as input and then produce logical forms such as SQL queries. And then we ask you the query to get the result. And the answer here are Switzerland, Serbia, and so on. As you can see, the answers are basically entities in the table. In fact, most existing table QA datasets focus on factual questions uh, with extractive and short form answers. And they primarily evaluate the ability of entity linking between question and schemas but they don't have so many questions that require complex reasoning and integration of information. So although we have made huge progress on these data sets, uh, they only reflect a part of big picture. To this end, uh, we introduce uh, FIDA QA for open domain free form table question answering. And we want to have more complex questions. And we want to move from extractive factoid short form answers to abstractive, explanatory, and long form answers. So here we show one example in our data set. So this is a table of a movie star called Joshua Jackson. 
And the question is, did Joshua Jackson even uh, ever star in The Simpsons? So previous data says only, uh, you know, required to look up the table for this movie title and then return a yes or no answer. By contrast, our data set needs to locate an entire row in the table and then generate a long sentence to fully describe the details. In addition, we cannot just simply copy the table content. For example, this particular note cell only has fragments of information and the model needs to rewrite it into a coherent and informative answer. So as this example shows, uh, our data set poses some new challenges. It requires the model to first retrieve multiple entities or numbers from the table based on the question. Second, um, they have to reason over relations of these entities and numbers, and then aggregate pieces of information together and then finally generate an informative, relevant, and faithful answer. Eventually, we collect over 10,000 pairs of table question free from answer, and we also have uh, supporting table cells. As you can see from this table, the median number of supporting, uh, supporting cells is six, and the median answer length is 18. So this means we have to reason multiple table cells to produce long form answers. The right figure also shows that we cover a wide range of topics as we use open domain tables uh, from Wikipedia. To test how challenging our data set is, we adapt two current state-of-the-art models for table QA. The first approach is a pipeline model with two stages. The first stage uses a weekly supervised uh, semantic parser to extract relevant table cells um, based on the user question, table content, and, and table title. Then the second stage uses a data to text module to perform a surface realization from table cells. So we can convert the predicted denotations to a free form answer. The second approach is on the uh, right side. It is an end-to-end -end model. We treat the task as a sequence-to-sequence -sequence problem uh, we first linearize the model of the table and uh, append it to the question as the source sequence. And then we use uh, transformer-based language models to generate freeform answers as the target sequence. So how did it perform? Uh, here are the automatic evaluation results. We found that the second end-to-end -end approach works better than the pipeline model. And um, the lower performance of the pipeline model is because first, uh, the weekly supervised semantic parser have inaccurate predictions. And second, um, this error propagates. So uh, after we predict relevant table cells, we treat them as a set of triples for data to text generation. In this way, we lose their uh, relational information. We further perform a human evaluation in several aspects. As we can see, even though large language models can produce full and text compared with the reference, they still generate answers that are inaccurate or do not contain all the information that is asked or not faithful or grounded to the table contents in the highlighted region. So this shows that we still have large room for improvement. Yeah, we already have a preprint on archive and we released our data set with some code for baselines. Uh, you are more than welcome to check those for details. And finally, thank for your attention. Uh, thanks for the organizer for uh, our last minute uh, change to the schedule. And any question or feedback is uh, appreciated. Thanks. Thanks, Rui, for the talk. Uh, any questions from the audience? I, I had a question if no one else is going. Uh, Rui, just a quick question. So uh, so what is the difficult part, like more difficult part in FedEx? Is it the selecting the salient cells? I know there is no proper annotations for that. Or is it gen given that cell generating the coherent answer? Well, I think it is, uh, I think based on our analysis, I think selecting relevant table cells is the bottleneck for the pipeline model. So we, we tried to, uh, you know, use a state-of-art uh, tapas semantic parser to, you know, um, 
retrieve random table cells, and we found that they do not do not really perform well, and and probably that's why uh, the pipeline mo model didn't work uh, as expected. Uh, so and we tried then tried to the end to end approach, uh, where we basically uh, use some. Um, uh, sequence to sequence learning to bypass this problem. And we found this works a little bit better, uh, actually a lot better than the pipeline model. Yeah, but I think, just, yeah. Just to, follow, just to follow up on the example you are showing on the slide. So for this thing, you can't select a single cell as the correct answer because the answer is a yes, no question, right? So like, why, uh, like I don't think tapas would work well on these questions. I see. Yes, we basically, uh, you know, fine-tuned tapas model and using the intermediate oh, okay. highlight uh, highlight cells to even fine-tune the tapas model for this. But still, we don't find a good uh, performance if we do this intermediate evaluation of this precision recall of those table cells. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, Walid, uh, whose, whose hand is raised. Uh, go on. Um, thank you very much. Very really cool work. Uh, I'm curious about uh, to what extent you think um, there is like an important part of this task is to actually like find that the right table in the first place. Um, my understanding is that it's currently set up to provide the relevant table as input. Uh, yeah, I think that's a good experiment. Uh, we could try to, you know, start with the uh, relevant table cells and together with the question and produce the answers. And I think that's a really good experiment to see uh, what's the most challenging part. Yes, uh, but currently we do not have that. Uh, we do not have that uh, results. Yeah. The other thing I was wondering about is uh, the aggregation component. I I don't see it here. Um, but maybe other other examples require some aggregation across different rows. Is that what you meant by aggregation? Yeah. So I think I only show one example here, and I, because limit of time, I I skip several slides for other examples. But there are some like uh, more challenging. Um, you know, you need to uh, deal with irregular table uh, layout and try to understand the relation between different columns and different roles. And then, and it is more challenging than this example because this example is just a, a single role, but uh, in other example, you need to look at different roles and different columns. And uh, maybe the rows and columns have some, uh, you know, non-common layout. And that is also challenging for the model to understand the relations between those table cells. Yeah. Thank you. All right, I think uh, we are out of time for questions. Uh, thanks again, Rui. And uh, that concludes uh, the, the last and the final uh, lightning talk. Uh, so I would like to thank and applaud all the lightning talk presenters. Uh, all the talks were really interesting. And uh, now uh, I would, uh, yes, yes, uh, yes, uh, virtual claps are uh, encouraged. Uh, and now I would like to invite Emily to introduce Vivian, uh, our next invited speaker. Sure. Um, and you can go ahead and, and start getting your slides set up. So I'm really pleased to introduce uh, Yannan Chen. Um, and thank you very much for accommodating the, the time zone uh, <laughs> here. Um, she is an associate professor in the Department of Computer Science and Information Engineering at National Taiwan University. Um, prior to that, she was a researcher at Microsoft Research Redmond in the Deep Learning Technology Center and also earned her PhD from Carnegie Mellon um, uh, doing between language understanding and, and generation and how they can um, both benefit each other in both training and inference. Thanks. Hey, thanks everyone. Can you hear me well? Yes, thanks. Okay, great. And it's my pleasure to be here to share some recent work from my group, which is about using the duality property for language understanding and generation. Okay, so this is the pipeline for classical dialogue system, test-oriented part. 
And usually we will have the ASL component to transcribe the speech into text. And we need to have the understanding part to pass the natural language into semantic form. And definitely we will have some state tracking and policy learning component. And the last component in this system is trying to generate a response based on the NLG model. So, and then synthesize the corresponding speech. And definitely the input can be speech or text only. But in this system, the important, two important components are language understanding and generations because these two components directly face the user. So the user will have the direct interaction for these two components. So we want to improve this two components performance, and probably we want to reduce the post, um, the requirement of the data. So let's look at natural language understanding module. The natural language understanding is trying to pass the natural language into semantics. So this is the natural language, which is the example. And the semantic friend, uh, in this example is the simple slot value pairs. There are multiple slot value pairs, and this is the input natural language. And for the generation module, this can be generated natural language based on the given semantics. So you can easily think about there's a strong duality between these two models, right? So we find that there is a strong duality between NLU and NLG. So we want to leverage this duality relationship because in the previous research, usually we will train understanding model and generation model independently just based on their training data. But if they have the strong duality, is it possible to utilize this duality to improve both model? And probably we can reduce the training data. So our first solution is we utilize dual supervised learning for improving these two components. Dual supervised learning was proposed for machine translation um, three, um, three, three years ago. And the idea is that for machine translation, we can consider we have two domains. One domain is for one language and another domain is for another language. And we will have two tasks, trying to translate from X to Y and to from Y to X. There are two different translation tasks. So if we have this duality, we will have this joint probability can be decomposed into these two equations. So for this one, which is given y and we will estimate the conditional probability through this task through this model and then this one is based on the above link for this bridge okay so this joint probability can be decomposed based on the this branch or this branch so ideally we will have the model to model the condition, conditional probability for this task or this task, which is the machine translation task in this example. So dual supervised learning is trying to use this information for both training components. For example, original objective function for a single task from X to Y, we usually minimize this loss. And for another one from Y to X, we also have the corresponding objective function. So they are independent to each other. But if we have this information, we know that this information should be equal to this one based on our previous induction then we can add additional duality loss which is we want these two information can be close to each other so this is the information from this equation minus this part so if this value will be lower which means this duality represent 
duality relationship will be enhanced. So that means that when we churn one single task, we will implicitly utilize another task information based on this small loss. But in this equation, this one can be estimated by the given task, and this one can be estimated by this model, right? But we still need to have the probability estimation for this two marginal distribution. So the problem comes to how can we model this marginal distribution for this two domain? So this information, uh, this approach was proposed for machine translation. So it's relatively simple to estimate the marginal distribution for natural language. But in our case, let's go back to NLU and NLG. In our scenario, our X domain is natural language and our Y domain is semantic frame. So we need to estimate a marginal distribution for P of X and P of Y. For P of X, which is relatively simple because we can directly take some training data, which is the natural language for a certain language. And then we just train a length model so that we can estimate the probability for a given sentence. So we can easily use a simple, for example, Angan or GRU to do this length modeling. And definitely you can use other models. However, for semantic friend, which is relatively difficult, because usually we will treat the NLU module as a multi-label classification problem because they contain several slot value pair. So each label is the slot value pair and they will contain several labels. So you can think about this is a semantic friend and each dimension indicate a single slot value pair in our ontology. So how can we model this marginal distribution for Y, for semantic domain? So the naive way is that we can also utilize our training data and we just simply calculate the probability for each label. And if we, can, if we have a given Y, we just multiply the corresponding labels together and we can estimate the current P of Y. So this is a very naive approach and also very intuitive. However, if we want to multiply this P of Y together, it means that we assume each label are independent to each other so that they can multiply them together. So the label here, one label indicate a single slot value pair. So in our scenario, we may not have, this assumption may not hold because the labels may not be independent. They are corresponding to each other. For example, if you find a restaurant which is McDonald, usually they may imply the price is not expensive. And also some, French restaurant probably imply the price is relatively expensive. So they will have some relationship between different labels. They are not independent. So this naive estimation may not be accurate. Therefore, we propose another solution trying to do the precise estimation for semantic threat. This is called mass autoencoder, which is also proposed by other paper. So the idea is very simple. They just use autoencoder idea and trying to model this sequential dependency among different labels. So utilizing this autoencoder, then we can implicitly model this de dependency for our label so that we can have final estimation for the given Y. Okay, 
So this is our proposed approach. So what should we do that? Currently, we want to compare if we use this additional dual supervised learning, whether we can improve the existing NLU and NLG model. So you can use any type of NLU and NLG component. And for this ex experiment, we use very simple NLU and NLG, and we want to see that whether we can improve the performance by just in induce this additional loss, duality loss. And this is the result. We have NLG baseline and NLU baseline, and we find that after we add this dual supervised learning, use the naive approach, we can improve the performance for generation, but have slight, um, but may not be improved the performance for understanding. The reason is that our estimation for semantic frame may not be accurate, right? So if we use name to do the estimation, then we can improve both components consistently. So this is the first solution. But after we get the first approach, we will also think about can we util fully utilize this duality to better train NLU and NLG? Because previously, we, we have the supervised learning for two components. Is it possible to do a, a semi-supervised or even a supervised approach just utilizing this strong duality? like machine translation. So let's go back to our NLU and NLG. So the idea is we want to have this perfect cycle. Hopefully we will, if we only have X, we want to go through this primary task from natural language to semantics and go through the generation model and reconstruct to original X. So this is the primary cycle. And for another cycle as well, if we only have semantic frame, for example, sometimes you only have a lot of um, machine comment, which is semantic format, but you do not have the natural language corresponding to the semantics. So that in this case, you will have the dual cycle. You only have Y, but just little X, and you can go through this cycle and reconstruct to original one. So this is just our idea. We want to force the duality by utilize this reconstruction arrow. And hopefully the input can be it only natural language or only semantics. So our input, our X side is natural language and Y side is the semantic trends. And to enable this learning objective, we will have the explicit feedback and implicit feedback. The explicit feedback includes some reconstruction error, like reconstruction likelihood, which are aligned well with our previous idea. And additionally, we can also have some automatic evaluation score as the reinforcement learning reward. For example, we can utilize the Bruce score or Roach score as the additional feedback, which is also the explicit feedback for NLG. And for NLU, we can calculate the F score, F1 major, for evaluating our semantics. So this score can be the explicit feedback to go through our full training cycle. And some implicit feedback can be model-based data distribution estimation result, like language modeling result or mass autoencoder result. So to enable this full training, joint training approach, we will adopt some gradient propagation approach, like straight through or distribution as input. And we may not have time to go through the detail, but the idea is you can use hybrid objective, including some supervised objective and also unsupervised one. And you can also use reinforcement learning to adapt, to uh, enable this full cycle training. 
So this is our flexibility to enable joint learning for NLU and NLG. In this case, we propose a general learning framework and they can be utilized for any type of NLU and NLG. And you can also design your own supervised learning objective and reinforce learning objective to enable this full cycle training. So you can see the result. This is the previous baseline and your supervised learning result. And utilize the joint training, you can see the improvement, especially for understanding parts. So we can see that this joint framework provides the flexibility and we can have the potential to do semi-supervised learning or unsupervised learning. And definitely, in, in our experiment, we find that it's also still very difficult to do the fully unsupervised learning if we do not have any label for one domain. We, in, if we need to enable the full cycle training, still need to have the small set of information for both domain in order to make the full cycle training stable. So the best performance is achieved by using reinforcement learning. And we use the blue and rose score for generation and use the F1 major for our understanding module. So here we showed up some generated example. And this is the baseline approach for the semantics. You can see that they miss some information compared to the ground truth. And our proposed one can have the complete semantics. And definitely, if we miss some information for the baseline, the generation result will be poor. So the baseline for generation part will be um, will miss some information, which is important compared to the ground truth. So you find that previous approach, although they showed uh, some relatively good result, but the improvement for generation model and understanding model may not be the same. They find that usually they improve more for generation part, but improve less for understanding part. So we want to further enhance this joint framework by utilizing some dual mutual information. The idea is that because our data distribution for these two domains are too different. Different from machine translation. In machine translation, X domain is natural language. Another Y domain is also natural language. So the data property will be similar. But in our case, one domain is natural language, but another domain is semantics. So we want to encode this semantics or natural language into the latent space. But in the latent space, their representation may not be close to each other, so that we may not be able to get very good performance by utilizing this joint framework. So we want to enhance the performance in all, by utilizing, by um, make this representation for natural language and representation for semantic friend can be close to each other. How to make this enforcement? We use MMI. We want to maximize this mutual information between the representation for these two domains. It's very simple. We just utilizing, we just add additional loss in our objective and trying to make the representation for these two domain can be close to each other. So we want to enhance this mutual information. And the approach we use is deep in informax. Because mutual information cannot be directly used as a training objective due to its intractability. So in order to make it trainable, we need to estimate some mutual information by back propagation, which is proposed by previous work. So the idea is we add additional 
by the discriminator. The discriminator is trying to distinguish the positive sample and negative sample. So we want to add this one to force the representation for these two domains can be close to each other. So in our primary cycle, we add this as the additional regularization. And hopefully, this representation for these two domains can be close to each other. And definitely for another cycle as well. So let's see the result. And in this experiment, we conduct to many different benchmark and data sets, including ACIS, SNPs, and E2E NLG. And for ACIS data, and you can see that adding MMI above our joint model, we can improve the performance a lot. And also, the improvement are consistent from other data sets. And especially for E2E NLG data, for generation part, the performance will be increased a lot significantly. And we conclude that connecting models using MMI can enforce the representation for semantics and language, and which is very useful for us to do this joint training. And you will also find that our in sometimes our improvement for NLU may not be significant, but we will already find that the performance is above 90%. So it's also very difficult to get additional improvement at this stage. But I think the performance are comparable to, with the baseline. And at, uh, until now, we already mentioned several approach to do the model training utilizing the duality. However, if we consider the practical scenario, sometimes we will have a large scale NLU and NLG model. And if we want to do training for this large scale NLU and NLG model, it seems impractical because usually we just directly take this pre-trained model and do some inference or fine tuning. If we want to do the retraining from scratch, utilizing the duality, it seems impractical. So in this scenario, we also propose the potential solution, which is dual inference. So this idea is very simple, just like the dual supervised learning in the first part. So in dual inference, our goal is we want to utilize the duality in inference stage instead of training stage because previous, previous work only used the duality in training. But here, we want to utilize the duality in inference. So how to do that? This is the normal inference process, right? So if we want to estimate f of x, and we will take the model, which is trend from x to y, and we will estimate and find the, the y prime, which has the highest probability. And for another side as well, this is the normal inference process. And in this inference process, we only utilize one model information. If we want to estimate, we want to find y, we only utilize the model from x to y. So here is the revised inference equation. We want to do inference using duality. This is the original inference part. And we add additional one, which is this part. What's the difference from these two? This part is we want to utilize the model, which is from y to x. This is the model from x to y. This is the trivial to estimate the conditional probability here. But if we want to utilize the information for another side, which is from y to x, how can we estimate the probability given conditional probability p y prime given x? So this part can be 
formulate as this equation by Bayes theory. So this is the same as our previous your supervised learning question. So for this one, we can get this result. So here is, we have original inference equation and we will have the, this information, which can be estimated by another model. And this is given y prime and the probability of x. And we also need to estimate additional marginal distribution for x and y. And because this is the, we want to find the y, so this term can be ignored. So what we really need is we want to estimate this marginal distribution for x if we want to have fx. And definitely for another side, we need to estimate the marginal distribution for y. So here the idea is the prediction from the model is reliable when the original input can be reconstructed because we need to utilize the another side of the model. For example, if this is the NLG, NLU, NLU model, we want to estimate the semantics given the input sentence. We still need to consider the information for NLG model. Given semantics and generate the input sentence. So this is the dual inference. And dual inference approach can be applied to any scenario because they are independent to training. So in your training scenario, you can utilize the duality. And in your inference scenario, you can still utilize the duality by dual inference. And you can see after we add the dual inference, we can also get additional improvement even though we already use in duality in the training stage. You can see that the improvement is consistent for several data sets. And they also prove that demonstrate the practical scenario because we don't need to retrain any model. We only need to utilize the trend model in the inference stage. And this is the latest result. And you can also see the improvement are consistent as well. Okay, so to summarize my today's talk, the first part of our talk is about dual supervised learning, which is very simple way. We have the supervised learning for two components and we just add additional duality loss so that they can utilize the another side of the model. And the second one is we can provide a joint, super, joint dual learning framework to enable semi-supervised learning. And also we want to enhance this joint supervised, joint dual learning framework by adding the additional mutual information because we want to make the representation for two domain can be close to each other. So what we do is we add a accelerator MMI objective in order to enhance this joint learning framework. This is corresponding to our training stage for utilizing duality. And definitely we can utilize the duality only in inference stage. In this scenario, we don't need to train any model. We only need to calculate the inference probability and add it together. So this is our dual inference approach. And some, con some contribution from our talk contains, first of all, our data distribution property is very important because in this scenario, we need to consider how can we model the distribution for semantic frame. If we do not consider this semantic from a different financial language, which may not be easy to get improvement for both models. And also we show that 
we have potential to do unsupervised learning, but it's impossible to do not have impossible to do fully unsupervised learning, which is if we do not have one side of the data, we only have, for example, if we only have natural language without any semantics, in this case, which it may not be possible, but it's possible that we may not have the aligned pair and we can utilize these two set of data and try to make this cycle and do the joint learning. So we show that there's a potential to achieve unsupervised learning for this scenario. And dual inference is for practical scenarios because we don't need to return the model. If your model is pretty large and is using this approach is very simple. And finally, our, um, our approach showed some better performance and also very flexible for diverse type of NLU and NLG module. You can use any type of model and apply this duality and you will get improvement. And this is my today's talk. And thanks everyone. I'm ready for some questions. I have a question um, at next talk. So um, in terms of like other components of dialogue systems, like sometimes, you know, there's the dialogue and some data sets, there's the dialogue state tracking part. And sometimes what like is being generated is more like a clarification question. Um, have you looked at any other like parts of the, the pipeline or, or pairs that could be complementary besides the NLU part and the NLG part? Mm, I think if we consider a duality perspective, I think the NLU and NLG may be the unique one for the current um, component in dialogue system. And for the uh, dialogue state, dialogue state can be um, for as the one type of understanding component, understanding example. So if we replace the NLU with the dialog state tracking, I think it's reasonable, but the generation part will be multi-turn generation because the um, dialog state tracking, usually your input will be multi-turn conversation and you output the state. But in the generation scenario, if you want to have the uh, offset, so you need to generate a multi-turn conversation. And I think in this scenario, which may not be uh, similar for the generation model in a natural language, uh, in a dialogue system, but I think in some scenario, probably you can use this uh, duality for DST and another side of NLG. Thanks. Um, I am curious about um, how the data, the difference in, you know, like the kind of data, the kind of natural language that we want to, like that's usually used in uh, NLU is different from NLG. And uh, so like what we call natural language, when we're thinking NLU, we're thinking like what a human is, like a request a human is making and what we call natural language in NLG is usually the system response to it. And really like it's not, we don't think of them as the same distribution really because they're, you know, people tend to say different things from uh, systems um, in response. Um, so I guess I'm curious about like the data that you used for the experiments and how, um, how did the pupils of X and Y um, were they different? Were they collected from the corresponding tasks uh, in these experiments? Or um, just, just curious to learn um, how you dealt with this discrepancy? I see, I see. Um, your question is uh, really good. I think um, 
in our data set, we formulate it as the simple way, which is uh, aligned well with our scenario. That we, uh, what we do is we take the NLU model, uh, NLU data, and we try to have the same data format as the NLG. So we do, we do not consider the, the domain is mismatched scenario. And for the, if we take the NLG data, and then we also reformulate it as the NLU scenario. So in this case, we treat two domain, uh, the input will be the same. And, but in, in, in re reality, in your, uh, in your question, which is our NLU only look at the information which is from the user side, but our NLG is tr trying to generate the agent's response. So they may have different distribution, right? So I think um, we will face this uh, challenge if we directly apply to the real data. But I think in the ideal scenario, which is the natural language, um, because the agent, if the agent is the very good agent, and probably their generation, um, their natural language sentence will have similar distribution as the user, although they will from different type of sentence, but the whole distribution will, should be the same. And also the semantic level will be also the same because in the user side, they will mention some semantic in their mind. And in the agent side, they also will prompt this semantic information, which will be given by the user, but the agent will also reply the same information to the user and add maybe the additional result. So I think the distribution level, I hope in ideal scenario, they will the same, but definitely in if you, you directly take the conversational data, probably we may not be able to apply to the current conversational data. So our data set is only take the NLU data and also reformulate it as the NLG or NLG data reformulated as the NLU. Excellent. Thank you, Vivian. No problem. Oh, I guess I guess we have time for one more question. Zilin, Zilin Ma'am. Hi. So uh, I would like to just build up on uh, Walid's question because um, I, I recognize that there's this difference between uh, like questions asked to like a dialogue agent and like the responses. I'm wondering whether, uh, because in, in, in re what, what this NLG model is trying to do is to kind of generate a request from the user, right? I'm wondering whether you have considered um, using this generation to kind of generate synthetic data for uh, doing data augmentation during training, for example. I see, I see. I think the um, this will be slightly similar to data augmentation because mm. we also consider this, um, um, you, you can think that um, we consider this uh, whole cycle and utilizing this whole cycle to generate some uh, additional natural language or additional semantic to do the training. So I think they can be, they have seen the idea, but I think these two approach can be independent and they can be added together. Like we can also add uh, augment the data and the augment data can also be utilized using our duality loss, right? That although their idea is similar, but they can combine it together because there are two different approach. So I think we will have the potential to add into some augmented data set. Hmm. Okay. So we yeah. also show that uh, this approach, because we enhance this cycle, right? So they can reduce the training data and achieve the similar performance. Hmm. And which also the same, like we augment some information and maybe the information may not be the final sentence, but they will have some representation to help us in the model, mm. in the information inside the model. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you so much. I guess that wraps up the, the QA session. Uh, please join me in thanking Vivian again for, for her invited talk. This was really interesting work. Thanks, Vivian. Thank you.
Thanks, Vivian. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, I guess uh, we can now disperse for another break. Uh, this break would be for 10 minutes. Uh, and we'll return for the third invited talk of the session. And following that, we'll, we'll have the open discussion. All right. I'm going to stop uh, the recording uh, while we're on a break. Um, but yeah, like similar to a workshop, feel free to hang out and stop other people on the in the room if you'd like to. A lot of the use, um, a lot of the user requests are actually uh, about things that may not be represented in the structured knowledge. So um, with that, uh, let me oops, uh, continue uh, with my introduction. Uh, so basically, uh, recently, we are seeing a lot of work about uh, large language models pre-trained from large amounts of data. Uh, they have been quite, quite successful in uh, uh, many natural language processing tasks, including conversational response generation. And uh, a lot of the recent work is focusing on like, how can we uh, uh, make pre-training more convenient for the end tasks or making models more appropriate for the end tasks or trying to do zero shot learning from these models and so on. Uh, and uh, of course we are uh, benefiting a lot uh, from uh, these forms of models in uh, response generation. Uh, uh, but there are still so many challenges that are remaining. Uh, for example, uh, the, we do get a hallucination uh, in the responses that are generated, which could be resulting in embarrassing things uh, from the conversational system perfect perspective. Uh, we do see a stereotypical bias and inappropriate content in the responses that we are trying to uh, prevent and uh, we do see responses that do not make sense. So uh, our main approach has been uh, grounding response generation on some form of knowledge that is related to what the conversation content is or uh, what the user is requesting about. Uh, that uh, knowledge comes mostly from unstructured uh, text, but also sometimes uh, structured knowledge graphs. So I chose two topics, uh, task-oriented uh, conversations with unstructured knowledge access. Uh, that is for more task-oriented dialogue systems. And then uh, same area for uh, open domain conversations is going to come next. Our investigations basically in this area. Uh, so for task-oriented conversations, we have been basically uh, looking into how do we uh, respond to these user requests that are um, not in the uh, structured uh, resources. Uh, we did organize a, a dialogue state tracking challenge. Uh, we introduced the task, we did organize a challenge last year. Uh, we did uh, perform our own experimentation, published our own results as well. And with the findings, with what we learned from this challenge, we did uh, yet another challenge this year, mostly focusing on uh, the spoken uh, conversations. So what do I mean by all of this? Uh, let's start uh, maybe at a higher level. Conversational systems are usually studied in two areas uh, mostly recently. Uh, open domain social conversational systems where the focus is uh, mostly uh, natural uh, responses and uh, relevance of responses to the conversation context. Uh, knowledge integration has been used by us, by others. Uh, and uh, on the other end uh, are the task-oriented uh, uh, dialogue systems. Here, usually the resources are uh, more structured resources, like structured databases or APIs uh, that, uh, uh, that are defined on top of them uh, that do complete the tasks and so on. 
Uh, however, this form of like division is very unnatural from the user's perspective, uh, because in both contexts, they may have uh, re requests or they may have turns uh, that are about the other type of dialogue systems. So in an open domain conversation, uh, they may ask about, the, uh, about uh, a task or in a task oriented conversation, they may actually ask about the uh, open domain questions uh, about uh, reviews or information further information about the task and it's important for uh, uh, completing conversation to be able to respond to these forms of requests uh, so imagine the task oriented conversation case uh, you, user may be looking for some uh, task like booking train tickets and the normal flow is we just go back and uh, interpret users' utterances and go back the resources and return to them with responses. However, when they ask something that is uh, important for the task, but not answerable by the API, uh, we go back and then say like, sorry, I don't know about that, which actually kills the purpose of the overall dialogue system because then going to web using the uh, textual web interface is probably much easier. Uh, to complete the task than having a conversation. So our proposal was, there is a lot of information on the web. Can we integrate them into the conversations uh, and uh, basically add them to the backend in addition to the uh, domain APIs and respond to users' requests and uh, so that they can actually go ahead and complete the task. So three, two important things uh, for this purpose. Uh, first of all, uh, users should be able to switch back and forth between the task and these open domain interactions uh, for task completion. And the system should not lose uh, track of the task status in between these transitions. Uh, so we focused the first year, we focused on the first problem. How do we get this information so that they can switch back and forth? And then uh, the second year we introduced, uh, reintroduced additional tasks uh, about the state of the conversation. Uh, so we did basically start with uh, publicly available data sets that people were already working on, uh, released by uh, Cambridge University, the multi corpus. And we did introduce additional knowledge seeking turns into these conversations. Uh, by the way, uh, so here I'm mostly looking into knowledge seeking uh, turns, but in natural conversations, there are also other ways where one can benefit uh, from these textual resources to create more lively responses back to the users. But for the purposes of this work, we basically started uh, more uh, uh, you, uh, you, proactive cases from the user's perspective, uh, not the system's perspective. Uh, so we enhanced the multi corpus with these uh, knowledge seeking turns. Uh, we also collected additional data uh, that are uh, from a different locale, uh, added additional domains and collected full conversations from scratch. Uh, so in this second round uh, of the challenges, we also included uh, spoken uh, conversations more uh, actually shifted the focus towards uh, more spoken conversations. Uh, so we do see this integration of uh, uh, knowledge into task-oriented conversations uh, formed of three tasks. Of course, it could be done end-to-end, -end, uh, but uh, to better understand uh, each of these tasks, uh, this was the first uh, step that we gave to it. Uh, first, uh, knowledge, we do detect turns uh, that are seeking knowledge in, instead of these uh, task-oriented uh, turns. Uh, then we do go to uh, our textual resources to find knowledge that would be relevant uh, to respond to these que questions. And then finally, given the knowledge taken from the, uh, these resources, uh, we generate responses that are uh, appropriate for the conversation context that integrate the knowledge that was found on the web. So this is the overall goal. So knowledge seeking turn detection could be seen as a binary classification problem. At each uh, user turn, you try to basically try to determine whether the user request could be handled by an API or it uh, requires seeking some uh, knowledge uh, from the web. The inputs are uh, most of the time uh, the user's utterance, the whole conversation history. And if you do have a limited resource uh, for knowledge responding, it, would, it could also be the knowledge snippets, available knowledge uh, resources. 
the next task is more of a ranking problem given the uh, uh, knowledge resources and given the knowledge seeking user utterance uh, we treat uh, picking the right uh, knowledge that can be integrated into the conversation uh, as a as a uh, classification uh, or a ranking problem and uh, the goal is basically from all the possible uh, knowledge snippets to find that one that could answer uh, the user's request to continue the conversation. Uh, and then finally, the gr knowledge grounded response generation is uh, treated as response generation task, where in addition to the conversation context, uh, you now also have access to knowledge snippets that are uh, relevant to the conversation context. And the output is, of course, the system generated response. Uh, so, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, we did perform a dialogue uh, sy uh, systems technology challenge last year. Uh, we had uh, over 100 submissions from 24 different sites. It was highly popular last year. Uh, we did uh, publish the results uh, at the beginning of this year at AAAI workshop. Uh, Many of the systems, they benefited, they all benefited from these uh, large language models. Uh, a lot of the systems uh, did uh, do into uh, entity extraction, uh, knowledge retrieval. And of course, a lot of the teams, as this is a challenge, did uh, benefit from assembling different systems. Uh, so we did publish our own baselines and our own improved results as well. Uh, so basically, for knowledge seeking turn detection, we treat this as a, a classification uh, problem, as I mentioned earlier on. Uh, we basically have in, uh, investigated several different language models. And uh, some of the things that helped us uh, uh, to return uh, the, to achieve high performance was basically doing data augmentation. In addition to the training data sets that we have provided everyone, we created additional data sets by just mining questions from the web and uh, making them more conversational. For example, through replacing uh, entities, explicit entities with uh, uh, referring expressions with pronouns and so on. Uh, and uh, for the knowledge uh, selection task, uh, we again use uh, the, uh, uh, different uh, language models. We fine tune them uh, towards the knowledge selection task. Uh, we do my negative examples uh, for each uh, uh, case uh, by just picking some random knowledge sentences. And uh, some things that helped us improve over our uh, simple baseline model is basically uh, mining the domain, uh, classifying the domain information from the conversation context and uh, reducing the knowledge candidates because there's uh, several knowledge candidates about several different domains. Uh, so reducing the knowledge candidates based on the uh, domain of the conversation context. Uh, and uh, yet another uh, uh, reduction method that we applied is entity tracking. Uh, so we do track the entities that have been mentioned in the conversation context, and we limit the knowledge candidates uh, to only the uh, uh, last three entities that were mentioned in the conversation context. Uh, so that has given us significant improvements over our uh, baseline as well, and uh, similar approaches have been used by other teams too. And then finally, for uh, response generation, again, we have fine-tuned uh, several different language models. Uh, in this case, we concatenated the whole dialogue context uh, with the knowledge answer that was selected uh, by knowledge selection. And here the target is the uh, response, uh, system response. And uh, for the training part, we did use the uh, knowledge snippets uh, that are the ground truth that were used uh, by the actual people who donated these dialogues to us. Uh, but of course, at the inference time, we use the uh, one best output from a uh, knowledge selection. Uh, so uh, we uh, compared uh, each of these uh, systems uh, based on a set of automated metrics. Uh, we did also perform human evaluation uh, and our results are on uh, the website um, that I will uh, share a pointer uh, in my next slide. Uh, but um, uh, we did uh, extensive human evaluation as well, uh, compared uh, 
about 10 of the participants, as well as our baseline and our improved system. Uh, we looked into appropriateness of the responses, uh, which is answered by the question, which response is more appropriate uh, to a given conversation context, and also accuracy of the response, uh, given the knowledge snippet. Uh, and uh, our best results are obtained with T5 uh, base, and it includes all of the components uh, that I uh, described uh, a little while ago. So uh, this is all good so far, but uh, all of this work is, and or actually majority of the dialogue work out there assumes uh, written conversations, uh, mostly because of the available data sets uh, and or the lack of the uh, available uh, speech data sets. Uh, however, uh, there is a mismatch between written and spoken conversations. There are several mismatches. Uh, here I do have one uh, written conversation. Below I have uh, a spoken conversation. Even some type of the things that uh, an agent would say uh, do not appear. Like, for example, OK, let me check. Uh, I'm just looking it up right now. And so on. That type of things do not really appear in written genre. So there are differences in word sequencing. Uh, there are disfluencies, uh, speech recognition errors, uh, lack of punctuation, uh, lack of capitalization, so many differences between written and spoken conversations. Uh, and uh, the conversational systems are usually most useful when uh, you're actually talking to them. Because uh, uh, typing, if you do have access to a keyboard and a screen, probably there are other ways to access this form of information as well. Uh, so uh, we did uh, uh, look into, and then in the last uh, paper that I mentioned at ASRU, we did look into, uh, does it result in uh, any performance degradation, uh, both for the tasks for knowledge seeking um, turn uh, integration, uh, knowledge seeking response integration, and also for other tasks important for dialogue, like dialogue state tracking. Some of these issues could be prevented by not just using ASR1 best, but you can get, for example, speech recognition issues. Uh, you can get uh, uh, ASR N best uh, from a speech recognizer and so on. So uh, this year's challenge, which we got recently got the results and published the very first automated evaluation results, uh, focused on uh, these both of these uh, types of tasks, uh, but uh, focused on uh, mostly how to be robust uh, to speech recognition, speech related issues. Uh, and uh, I do provide the two links. Uh, more information can be found uh, for both of these tasks uh, from the uh, uh, tr uh, track uh, repositories. So now uh, let me move on uh, to the other types of uh, dialogue systems where we do still use uh, unstructured knowledge uh, for coming uh, for uh, responding to users in an informative fashion. So here the main focus is uh, knowledge selection, uh, which is uh, of course a challenging problem. Uh, so uh, in this case, uh, you do again have a conversation context, uh, which is more open domain. And uh, the goal is uh, to uh, come up with uh, knowledgeable and uh, informative and natural uh, responses uh, to the users. Uh, so uh, our first thought was, well, existing work, including ours, uh, makes uh, brittle assumptions about these knowledge sources and how conversations do work. So we all have assumed that like there is a single relevant knowledge sentence for each context, and uh, that's going to be uh, reasonable enough to target uh, for knowledge selection. Uh, however, um, that may not necessarily be the case. Conversations, especially open domain conversations, are quite open. Uh, so we then took uh, Wizard of Wikipedia as a target. Because uh, 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 Wizard of Wikipedia matches uh, the conversation types where there's a system, knowledgeable system, and then there's a user integrating, uh, interacting with that knowledgeable system. Uh, and uh, we examined first uh, certain examples, and then here are some examples. Uh, are really uh, conversations, uh, or should really the conversations be continued by a given knowledge sentence? Here is one uh, kind of like limited context where the user asks a, a question and uh, the system is supposed to answer. 
Uh, this is the ground truth knowledge snippet uh, chosen by the uh, crowd worker in the case of WoW. But there are several alternative relevant knowledge snippets talking about other guitarists. So when doing the knowledge selection, it doesn't make sense to mark these as negative examples. These, are, these could be uh, positive examples in certain knowledge contexts as well. So our feeling is the knowledge selection uh, task is more a subjective uh, decision. Uh, that could be especially in open domain conversations where the questions are not necessarily factoid. Uh, and this uh, also uh, can be seen other types of conversations where the user does not ask a, a question in this case, uh, but they're talking about a topic and uh, we, they, we can have several different knowledges to continue that conversation, to come up with an interesting response uh, back to the user. Uh, so these were the initial examples, then we actually did coordinate a, a study about this topic. So we hired uh, 40 experienced annotators. Uh, we uh, gave them some information on what this task is, uh, what uh, sort of things are we looking for, and we gave them 20 dialogue contexts to annotate. In each case, we gave them 30 knowledge candidates, again from the visitor of Wikipedia corpus, uh, the uh, five articles uh, related to the conversation context. And we asked them uh, to annotate these 610 knowledge snippets in total uh, with their relevance to the given conversation context. And uh, we asked them uh, to try to stick to the conversation topic. So it shouldn't change a relevant sentence, uh, should be relevant to the conversation context, and it shouldn't try to change uh, the topic of the conversation. So uh, interestingly, so of the 610 snippets, uh, a third of them were not selected by uh, any annotator. And uh, seven of them, uh, were selected by all annotators as relevant knowledge, but only one of these seven were actually in the uh, 20 uh, golden set for the 20 conversation context. And actually they didn't, uh, the golden uh, uh, snippet selection rate was about 0 0.77. So they didn't choose, the, and all, not all annotators choose the golden sentences. We looked into inter-annotator agreement between the all for all snippets or for all only the goldens and we have seen actually the annotator agreement uh, for overall is okay but not great then we looked into if this is subjective uh, can we get a certain subset of annotators that would actually agree with each other so we uh, took a uh, hundred ram random samples of 10 annotators from the set of 40 annotators and the highest that we could get was uh, an annotator agreement of uh, 0 0.59 uh, kappa oh, that's still showing that like there is some uh, uh, disagreement well, the disagreement could be indication of unreliable data, but we cannot really find agreeing annotators. So the disagreement, uh, lack of uh, inter-annotator agreement, uh, can also be an indication that this task is a more subjective task. So given this, uh, we actually went ahead and annotated more uh, knowledge snippets uh, for uh, different conversation contexts. Uh, so in this case, uh, we looked into almost 800 conversations. Uh, we did use fewer annotations, 10 annotators in this case, and <clears throat> we did uh, try to see if we can create a, a wisdom of crowd relevance instead of this one knowledge, single, no single knowledge sentence. And the statistics are, uh, again, similar on this set, uh, especially uh, uh, given all of the annotations. So we have average uh, of eight knowledge sentences per conversation context that are relevant. Uh, we did have some terms, we didn't have any relevant knowledge sentences, which is normal in uh, open domain conversations, it could be just uh, chit chat, or maybe there is just uh, no retrieved uh, good results. And uh, the only 5% of the conversations had only one relevant knowledge sentence, uh, when we chose them according to this uh, relevance threshold. And uh, this is basically that 5% is basically showing us uh, the uh, single knowledge sentence being relevant given any conversation context is actually an exception, not, necessar not necessarily the norm. Uh, so 
with these data sets that we collected, uh, 400 were from the training set, uh, 200 uh, was from test scene, 200 were from test unseen. Uh, we did do some further experiments. The very first experiment is, can we generate responses based on not the original gold sentences, but the wisdom of the crowd? And uh, so we did pick hundreds examples from uh, test seen and unseen. We again gave them to two expert annotators and asked them to, uh, uh, to uh, assign scores to each response based on the original uh, gold or the wisdom of crowd knowledge uh, on a scale of zero to two. And we did use GPT-2 medium uh, that was fine-tuned on uh, Wizard of Wikipedia for generating these responses. And as you can see, there is difference between uh, the, the, uh, the uh, knowledge snippets that are actually chosen by more people uh, rather than a single annotator, uh, especially in terms of uh, the informativeness. So this is some indicator that we could get some uh, good results by using uh, this uh, using a different way uh, to select uh, knowledge sentences. So we did also look into if we do train uh, knowledge selection uh, based on not the original wizard of Wikipedia annotations, but based on our uh, wow uh, wisdom of crowd annotations, we call it the wow plus plus. So we did generate uh, 12K training examples from the 400 training data set contexts uh, for the task of uh, knowledge selection. So in this case, unlike the original one, in each example, uh, we do not have one positive and uh, one negative or one positive and everything else is negative. Uh, but instead, uh, we do have uh, all the positives and all the negatives uh, represented in the training set. And uh, we compared it with the original uh, WOW setting. And we also combined the original WOW setting uh, with our, uh, uh, on our subset. Uh, basically in this case, so that we do have enough examples, we use all the uh, 30 negatives as, their, uh, as the negative examples. And we compared a bunch of metrics, including MRR at one, which is the most indicative. We compared these with unsupervised methods, uh, just used uh, Roberto without any fine tuning or fine tuning on the Wizard of Wikipedia data set uh, as a similarity metric to the conversation context. And then we did train a Roberto classifier with each of these different data sets. And we have seen that even though we do have much less data in the WOW++ case, it does result in a better MRR on the test set or better in terms of all metrics in comparison to WOW original, which has uh, 10 times as much uh, training examples, 10 times as many uh, training examples. And then finally, uh, we also did human evaluation. Again, uh, like the extrinsic evaluation that we did before. Uh, what happens if we do use these selected knowledges, the top knowledge in uh, response generation? Uh, and how do uh, humans uh, uh, evaluate uh, those uh, responses? Uh, so in this case, instead of, uh, instead of uh, asking them to uh, give a score, we actually pick the top next top model, uh, and then uh, we just compared uh, the TFIDF unsupervised approach uh, with our WOW++ uh, responses. And we have seen again that uh, much of the responses that we generate using the, uh, using the um, uh, data that is more subjectively annotated according to uh, wisdom of crowd uh, resulted in uh, more appropriate and more uh, informative uh, responses uh, for the users. So we do, I do understand that, of course, getting uh, this form of data is expensive. It's not easy to generate these data sets. However, probably we do not need to collect such large scale data sets, but smaller that are uh, more accurately annotated. Uh, so this is uh, mainly the outcome uh, from this study. Uh, so at this point, uh, I do want to not just talk about these works, but also mention some of the other recent works because in conversations, uh, very briefly, in conversations, 
uh, the uh, knowledge is not the only, uh, the uh, factual or world knowledge is not the only contributor. Uh, common sense and reasoning is also very important in coming up with the next responses. Uh, so our work has been also focusing on having uh, common sense reasoning in dialogues. And uh, we did publish recently uh, metrics uh, that would help uh, the sensibleness of the responses uh, at SIG dial. And for being able to study common sense, we did actually collect new data sets uh, based on the social IQA data set. So we did give the conversation, uh, we did give the context uh, in the social IQA data set as the conversation uh, context to Turkers and asked them to donate us uh, uh, responses, uh, self dialogues. Uh, sorry, self-dialogues that would show the common sense reaction uh, given the conversation context. And uh, we recently released this data set. It's available uh, on the uh, uh, GitHub uh, for Amazon Alexa. Uh, another area that we do focus on uh, these days is uh, task-oriented, uh, task-driven conversations with embodied agents. Uh, so uh, the language is ambiguous. Oftentimes, the real world is ambiguous as well. And recently, we do see several data sets, uh, but single turn data sets that enable all of us uh, to study conversations with embedded agents. Uh, however, uh, dialogue is very important in this kind of setups as well. So we, with this in mind, uh, and, and we did actually in our previous work have shown that you can improve the uh, task success uh, if you do have uh, uh, you do if you do enable the agents to ask questions during conversations on uh, vision and language data sets. Uh, so now we did collect a new data set that is not just navigation, but also includes task completion, uh, uh, tasks that are important for the house in for in house environment. Uh, and it's all based on AI tutor, uh, but with the new tasks and uh, new um, uh, uh, environments that uh, we are bringing to the picture. Uh, so this conversational data set has, we also released this uh, very recently. Uh, here is the link. I hope you will find it interesting. And in addition uh, to the data set, we are coordinating a new Alexa Prize challenge. Uh, the very first one was uh, focused on social conversations, which is still ongoing. Uh, we do recently, we did recently announce another one, which is about task completion on the web. Uh, and we are announced, we just recently announced another one, uh, which is more about uh, human and simulated agent interaction. The first stage is going to be offline and it's going to be using this data set. And in the next stage, we are going to actually have the simulated environment visible to the actual users and ask them to complete tasks through interacting with the agents uh, that they see on the uh, devices that uh, that have screens. Uh, and all the information and the data sets uh, could be found from this final link. So I'd like to wrap up uh, at this point, <clears throat> try to cover most of our recent work on integrating knowledge into conversations, uh, and uh, also mention some of these uh, recent data sets and tasks that we are focusing on. Uh, thanks for uh, listening, and I'm happy to answer if you have any questions. Thank you. Awesome, thank you so much for the talk. Like uh, it covers quite a range of topics and um, shows the breadth of work that uh, you are uh, working on uh, in this area. Um, any questions? Sachin? Sachin? Um, yeah, hi. I had a question regarding the first talk. Uh, that you had presented. So um, one of the key issues that you had raised was that when we switch from uh, task-oriented conversations to open domain conversations, um, there's a difficulty in terms of maintaining the dialogue state in case like the system comes up with a response that has an entity that the user later on refers to and that changes the state of the conversation. Um, so uh, I guess the first question is, uh, does the augmented multi-voice 2.1 data set 
cover such scenarios and the second one is like in general what's a good way to like tackle this inherent problem uh, when switching between the two kind of conversations thanks sachi that's a very good question mm -hmm. so uh yes uh so there are there are multiple challenges like for example where initially we had wrong assumptions that it's only the task related conversation that is important for task uh, entities that is not necessarily true we have seen in the examples that uh even the knowledge seeking turns or responses to knowledge seeking turns uh, could introduce new entities that are important for the task. Uh, so they shouldn't really be seen separate. All of this tracking should be run on all of the data. Uh, and uh, maybe the examples are not as much as we would want, but there are certainly examples in the extended multi uh that do work, especially in the, in the latest speech collection uh, that do work in this fashion. Um, uh, and uh, maybe the overall suggestion is not necessarily to separate them, uh, but looking at all conversations. So the, the very first architecture, like it's designed according to simplicity so that we could organize a challenge about this. Uh, but overall, uh, probably it's a good idea to just keep all, pass all the dialogues, all the conversations, still do both forms of pro uh, processing, uh, but uh, from uh, both forms of processing so that uh, we don't lose track of anything throughout the conversation. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, we have a question from Jillian. Hi. Um, hello. Yeah, th thanks for the very interesting talk. Uh, I learned a lot from this talk um, and I enjoyed it a lot. And uh, But I have one question concerning um, kind of knowledge snippet selection. So that was uh, about your, that kind of um, the example that you raised about booking a train and asking whether you can bring pets onto, um, onto um, like the train. So one question I have about, about it is, how, how do you kind of like do the selection of snippets? So I understand like, like the most direct ways to kind of maybe embed like the knowledge snippet in some way and either use TF, IDF or some uh, like neural network like Roberta to do that. But in this example, um, we, we see that like the train, right? Is a, it is kind of an entity referring to the specific train at there and like, um, I, and I, I, I do think that for different trains, they, they probably have different policies for kind of like um, bring pets. So how do you take into account the information mm -hmm. extracted fr from high up in the dialogue into doing this knowledge selection? Yes, yeah. uh -huh. it's a very good question. So yes, it does indeed change. Uh, so for example, maybe trains it is organized by uh, one authority so they can make suggestions but in other domains it does certainly change or maybe there are different train types so the response changes in other domains there are certainly different entities like different hotels and restaurants that they have that have uh, different uh, policies so uh, one thing that we do in our approach maybe I should have opened this one slide is uh, we do track what is uh, entities are mentioned in the conversation and then we do classify the conversation context into domain, mainly for this problem that you are mentioning, because you could have a have a uh, different domain, like maybe they're asking, can I bring my pet, but maybe it's a restaurant, maybe it's a hotel. And if you do just use simple methods, then it may look like a hotel could be relevant for the conversation about a, a restaurant, which would be good. Uh, and the same thing with the entities. So each of these uh, knowledge snippets can be associated uh, with the entities, right? Like in our uh, knowledge base, uh, for example, for trains, we do not have entity specific knowledge necessarily, but for the other domains, the restaurants and hotels, we do actually have knowledge snippets that are associated with each of these entities. So uh -huh. we do keep the preserve the entity knowledge, both in the in the knowledge and uh, we track it in the conversation and try to match them uh, to get the best results. Ah, uh, I see. Okay. Uh, is it possible called, to uh, uh, call ABC up is for is conversational it? agents plus knowledge bases? Yeah. Oops, I'm so sorry. I couldn't oh, sorry. hear it. <laughs> no, no, it's far from being that. So yeah, it's been interesting. 
although some of the presentations I already saw, but uh, maybe yeah, I let's, can let's mute. Yeah. something yeah, after, okay? Uh, where can we mute? You no, know? okay, oh, awesome. Yeah. Sorry, I wasn't sure if no one's talking to us or not. Um, uh, okay, okay, so um, sorry, I couldn't get the next question. Oh. I, I couldn't hear it. Oh, sorry. Jelen, do you have another question or should we oh, move to the I, I kind of uh, want to follow people? up on it, um, if, okay. if it's possible. Sure. Yeah, so, maybe, yeah, um, thank you. So I, I think from what you described, you, you kind of first resolve the entity within like the dialogue before you do this information retrieval step. Yes, yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, yes. because uh, from your side, I got the impression it was just kind of a general knowledge, Wikipedia type knowledge, kind of like mm -hmm. general. Okay, so now it makes it a lot clearer. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, hi, uh, thanks. I want to thank Dilek for the interesting presentation first. I enjoyed it very much. I, I would like to ask you about the explainability in the uh, knowledge grounded conversations because basically what we have as a problem now is that even if we try to come up with a knowledge grounded system we cannot understand during unfolding of the conversation which knowledge was selected and how it influenced the response and in the paper of 2020 that you wrote in the policy driven or response generation which was the i think behnam was the first author mm -hmm. what happened was that First, the way I, I learned and I understood the paper and I tried to basically uh, come up with a approach similar is that what happens is that the policy is some sort of intermediate representation that kind of conditions the generation based on the selected knowledge. But I see that in the recent approaches, that policy is also completely excluded and I think it, it, while the policy would give a bit of control and a bit of, let's say, uh, explainability to the effect of the knowledge, now it is again back to fully black box scenario. So about that, how much can we or have we progressed so far? Oh, that's a very good question. So uh, we do use the uh, policy driven, uh, basically for Alexa Price. And right. we did actually provide the policy driven uh, neural response generators uh, to the university team so they can actually back up. We did provide them a bunch of uh, response generators, uh, but mm -hmm. one of them is uh, basically policy driven. Uh, and it is uh, based on a simpler policy, uh, which is basically just using the knowledge as in the paper, uh, just using the knowledge topics. Uh, and uh, the dialogue acts of the sentences. And it does result in very like more um, uh, appropriate, like more appropriate responses to the context because just these responses are not abrupt. It usually uh, gives some reasonable feedback to the user. Right. Uh, we haven't tried or focused on that approach too much in this context of uh, task-oriented conversations. That's a good question. Uh, we should. <laughs> we just haven't experimented with this data set to how yes. to do each of these things. But, but it would be very interesting, like following on your question, to kind of uh, combine the policy of the task oriented part with this form of a policy. So, in my mind, actually, though, even those two should be the same policy. Yeah. So, these are um, all future areas. I'm sorry. Go ahead, please. No, no, I, I'm sorry. Ju just because I'm interested to learn more about you, I keep interrupting you. I apologize. And oh, the, because I, I was thinking that, for example, what happens is that uh, the policy and uh, the, the policy can become some sort of the state. So, at the moment of state inference and tracking the dialogue state, what can happen is also the, 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 the knowledge and policy inference. So it, it is some sort of augmenting the current state inference of a task-oriented system and consider also knowledge a part of the state. Yes, it does, exactly. I see. Yes, uh, um, uh, uh, thank you very much once again. Thanks I'm for done. the question. <laughs> thank you. Um, right, we have a question from Rahul. 
So, uh, so my question is on the the latest track in Alexa Prize, where uh, the human machine conversations. So, if I understand correctly, uh, the the task over there would be to teach a robot to do things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know? Yes. Like, this this seems very uh, different from like the standard human machine conversation things you would expect, right? Like, won't having a database and go book a restaurant or or you know like uh, book a train ticket be a much more tractable place to start than like manipulating objects in the real world or something it because is. we can't solve any of these right yes 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 it is it is and i'm quite excited about this area because personally i don't really like even if i ask my uh family members like can you bring me this right they're gonna ask me three questions and i don't really believe in like just this one shot interaction with an agent it will figure it out of course we don't want this chatty bot that is supposed to complete tasks and keeps talking to you but in certain cases it should really ask a question instead of doing the wrong task or just messing things up uh, and there hasn't been really much focus on that so this challenge is basically uh, specifically focusing on these uh, situated agents in real or simulated environments hopefully in the real environments in the future also uh, and and then just getting them to complete the task uh, with a reasonable minimal effort from the user side so that they can actually over time learn from the users like where things are uh, how a task is a special task is done uh, so these are going to be the main uh, focuses for this new challenge and it's, and it's pretty different and this environment like so there would be like a simulator which is released or something which you know people who are participating in this challenge can yes. play with yes uh -huh. and the initial work is based on ai tutor the first data collection is based on ai tutor uh, but you can imagine the uh, future future versions and the simulator will need to be released so that the teams uh, can actually train something that would be ideal for the actual alexa users thank you you're welcome thanks rahul <laughs> so the like i um have a, a question that's kind of broad um but i it's a rare opportunity to ask you that question. So you have a dual role in like both as a you know member of the scientific community working in this area, uh, so advancing the science uh, industry as a whole, and also as um, like as a, an Amazon employee, right? And like a leader in this uh, on Alexa, right? And I'm wondering how do you balance between like the scientific contribution and both like engaging because like of course Amazon benefits from the Amazon the contribution of the scientific community on problems that matter to Amazon but also there is IP and there is like privacy issues involved uh, so I'm quite impressed by uh, the like amount of engagement that uh, your team and Amazon Alexa as a whole have been doing with the broader scientific community I'm wondering how do you keep that balance um, to be more concrete, uh, the data that you share um, probably have some that you can probably share everything that you are using internally. So the task representation or the task definition that you share publicly is probably different from the task definition that's internal. So how do you keep that, you know, like how do you decide what to keep and what to share? Uh -huh, uh -huh. It's a very hard question, but a very good question. <laughs> so I think uh, it is very important to do science like in those areas that to have some use in the end, like no science for the sake of science only, but also uh, some that's that's very important to me. But I do also believe that like to do reasonable science, you actually need a lot of data and real data. So I do follow wherever the data is. And but when it comes to privacy, that's a perfect example. So maybe I'm not really balancing things, things too much, but uh, the customer data or any form of Alexa data is unfortunately off the boundaries. Although we uh, do experiment with real use cases, it is very hard to share. But it is very important to be uh, to be uh, very consistent or like side by side with the actual research community also, because it doesn't make sense to just show just some improved results. There's always this question in my mind, but how do you do in comparison to this other approach so and so has been working on? So what we try to do, what my team basically try to do is we always find 
additional public data sets that are closer to the task that we are interested in, we are working on. If there is some uh, internal data set, of course, we do involve in, in the experimentation as well. But this way, uh, one, we could show that we are actually uh, doing uh, good in comparison to the rest of the science community by sharing our results. By sharing our data, we actually also attract some interest from the external science community, just not just internally, because these are the problems that are important uh, to make these things work. So then why not share the data? So that's basically the principle that I have had. But for being able to do this, you of course need to spend a lot of time working with the other teams in Amazon, not just the scientific community. So that's how I'm kind of like trying to balance things by paying attention to both sides and then hoping that it will actually contribute to good work. But I can't say so far so good, so it's very hard to balance, as you can imagine. Yeah, it seems to be working well. Um, I, I guess just a quick follow-up here. You see differences in the kind of data that's available publicly that people are publishing and you're contributing to and um, internal data. Well, I, I'm sure there are differences, right? Like, do you think the differences and this data, these data artifacts are significant enough to to be uh, so th so that like whatever results you get on the public data sets are not representative of how these methods would perform on the local data sets. So the focus is more on the challenging problems uh, that we can see on both sides. So that if we identify the challenging, difficult problems, then we focus the uh, data collection or the data that we release on those. Then I think it benefits both sides. Uh, so that's how, how, how I basically try to do it, like just basically think of uh, be very involved in what is happening in the actual life in the shorter term and also the longer term, then identify the challenging problems and then try to make it into something public. Got it. Thank you so much. <laughs> no um, problem. Yeah, I don't, I don't see any more raised hands. Um, thank, thank you, you so, so much. much for your time uh, and, and sharing your um, awesome work with us today. Thank you. Um, Thanks for inviting yeah. me. It was an interesting discussion also. Thank you. Um, all right. So the next thing we have is um, an open discussion. And uh, I thought a lot with the other organizers about how to like moderate this discussion. And um, the best, uh, you know, like we came up with was sharing this slide with a bunch of questions. Um, kind of the, to initiate the conversation. Hello, can you hear me now? Um, I think my voice dropped for a few seconds. I hear you fine. Okay, um, yeah, so, uh, Please don't feel restricted by these questions or topics. Feel free to discuss uh, whatever like questions or thoughts uh, that you'd like to share or ask about. Um, it's um, it's just meant for guidance for like to start the discussion. Um, so to kick things off, I'm going to uh, ask anyone who wants. Um, yeah, of course. To like, uh, thank you for for your time. Um, yeah, anyone who wants to take uh, the questions, let me start with uh, high level questions. I'm, I'm going to try to like maybe spend uh, five to 10 minutes, depending on how much people are interested on each of these categories and then move on to the other. Uh, so the first one is like high level questions. What do you think um, are the most important questions uh, in this area to address if you, if you have to choose only one? So I can start. Uh, one thought I have is uh, basically, and our speakers did uh, mention this, right? Uh, that we are using like, you know, these these large language models, but then like, the, the important thing is like, how do we make sure that what they're you know, saying is grounded or it can be acted upon? I feel uh, that's a pretty open and important problem. And which is why we have like this large difference between uh, task-oriented dialogue and open conversations, which is mostly artificial and um, 
depends on the backends which can support the things you want to do so how do we you know ground the things being said thank you for what you brought me yeah definitely um and i say i think i know of at least one uh work in this space um not sure if it's public yet or not so i'm not going to be able to uh, to talk about it so raul just a quick thought so i i know i mean so we're talking about grounding it in a more systematic manner but uh, i think there are no data sets but it's still worth it try giving the whole let's say your object context into the large language model and given it can understand anything like code or schemas or anything so do you think just trying that out also is a one possibility then rather than just generating a basic semantic parse you generate a grounded one which sees everything possible uh, like for the end model yeah like, like basically uh, what i mean is serializing your uh, knowledge graph or object context or database i i remember seeing similar works from uh, from like salesforce um which wish to do something um it's what so they try to basically have like the transformer always conditioned on the representation of a sql table right um, yeah but the problem is right like uh, even if your model is producing a output you need a way to right right i mean what you yeah. mean is uh, these models the implicit copy we want to make sure that it is actually referring to a particular thing exactly is what you mean yeah. i think also delex uh, talk she touched on the number of uh, important problems from her perspective and um, they include like the differences between spoken and written language um I, that one uh, i think is quite you know uh, it's quite clear i think to to everyone who's interacting with those systems um i i guess uh, relating to this point uh, another point that i was thinking about that relates to this is that uh, how i think of grounding is kind of two ways one is uh kind of like grounding every kind of for example utterance uh, to, to kind of resolve the dialogue state for each utterance, you can ground some knowledge uh, before it. Or you can also try to just combine entire knowledge graphs into a language model. Uh, I, I think I've seen some work, um, I think it might be by AI2 on uh, knowledge, but whereby they kind of just kind of like uh, integrated um, ConceptNet and um, Wikidata into a language model. So. Do, do you guys think whether there is a pro and con to either approaches? What's the question? Oh, so the question is, um, so we want to integrate structured data together. We want to use that structured data together with large language models, right? So how exactly might we want to kind of like use this? Do we want to ground them on a per utterance basis? Or might we want to have a more like, you know, during training, we want to train these slash language models together with the objective of learning structured knowledge in itself. So, I mean, a lot of structured knowledge is very local and mm. is, I mean, we can't have a generic knowledge, let's say some users uh, context, like let's say what you, you are currently listening to or what you generally like to have on your phone or something like that. So mm. I think there still needs to be a module which can take a, Con, uh, graph conditionally and then try to ground it to it mm. rather than assuming that there would be a global world knowledge. I mean, that that, that works for a, uh, for an open domain. Mm. I mean, even for open domain, things change, like new albums come, new songs come every day. So you can't mm. rely on existing knowledge, which is injected in the model. Yeah. Mm. But oh, I, I still see. feel the model should be able to uh, condition themselves on a given local graph or local knowledge for that particular utterance. Interesting. Um, I think the question of also like uh, grounding to structured data in pre-training has come up in like the crowdsourcing that we did for these questions quite a bit also. Mm -hmm. uh, seems, you know, it seems obvious that like uh, our models are very dependent on pre-training these days and mm -hmm. um, 
it, we're bound to get improvements from uh, figuring out how to do this effectively. And I don't know that there is like, I, I haven't seen personally like a very, you know, like clearly effective way of doing that, uh, but I may have missed something. So if you know something, please share it. Yeah, I, 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 yeah. I, I think um, your point makes a lot of sense, um, and I, I think this kind of goes back to um, the point that uh, Dalek uh, actually mentioned in some of her talk uh, about mm. you know some of like the knowledge snippets right. um, that might be kind of contextually related to the dialogue because you exactly. can't just resolve for like trains in general, right, or hotels in general. You kind of you want yeah. to have a specific. And I'm wondering, uh, for this type of knowledge grounding, um, are there some ways that, uh, okay, maybe we're, we're going to modeling, but like, what might be the best way to kind of model this, um, this kind of like local graph into like, uh, like language models? Right, I, I guess that, that leads to the question of, uh... Like, is there even a public data to do such thing? Like, if we talk, mm. if you're talking about pre-training, like, what, what, what would such data look like? Mm. Yeah, I, I've seen some work by, um, I think Facebook, um, that they have like a parallel corpus of dialogue and then like a, a very restricted like user graph, knowledge graph, and then they kind of like model the problem as, uh, like. A dialogue and kind of like walks on this graph, so it's like paths of notes um, on this on this graph. So that might be potentially one way to 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 think of um, integrating structured knowledge. Right. I, I'm also happy to hear about like what you guys think about uh, you know how structured knowledge can be potentially used. All right, um, yeah. let's actually no, move sorry, to wait, another, uh, let's move to another uh, category. Um, I think evaluation is quite important. And actually one of the talks today, uh, the FEDA QA was quite impressive uh, in terms of like data set for evaluating progress um, on um, like how can, we understand tables and not just find the relevant parts piece of information for a question, but also like generate a natural language uh, representation of the answer. Um, I think there's no like one answer like to this, like what is the right data set or like what is the right benchmark? But what are, I'm curious, like what do you guys think are like the, things we need to measure, like what are the tasks that we should be even including in such a benchmark? And like the thing about dialogue is it's very, um, like it has everything. It has NLU, it has ASR, it has NLG. So it's like, it's quite broad. Um, so what should we be using to measure progress on this in this area? Or maybe we should just accept that it's not like it's it's not just one thing. It's uh, we can treat it as a monolithic thing, and it has a bunch of components. And we have to work on the components. Uh, maybe I, I can get things started. So one 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 thing that I, I feel that NLG uh, in dialogue systems probably should be evaluating is some notion of how uh, concise the response is. Even even though two responses may have the same semantic content, they are conveying the same information. But in some cases, you might want to have a more concise. Uh, response from the dialogue system. Something as, as simple as if, if you have a query like set an alarm for six, seven, eight, and nine, uh, you don't want a system setting an alarm for 6 a.m., uh, setting an alarm for 7 a.m. and 
go, going on with that, right? You want something a bit more fluent, a bit more concise. I don't think any of the evaluation metrics uh, do that uh, explicitly. Perhaps they are doing that indirectly because the reference itself is concise. Uh, but yeah, maybe worthwhile to investigate in that direction. Yeah, I also uh, more like how should we have explicit factual checking? Let's say we are generating from a structured format, let structured meaning representation, and then going from that to NLG, and that has some values. So should we have explicit check, check that uh, the data is factually correct in the generated output, or should we just for keep following blue rouge uh, these metrics for the NLG component? So one of the things I like about some of the public data sets is that they kind of separate these two things, like the the uh, like the first check that you got the correct uh, you know piece of information, like kind yeah. of evaluating the fulfillment piece of it, and separately for, uh, I guess the NLG part of uh, things like uh, uh, multi walls right. is actually uh, what not I, what, very what interesting. What I mean, Wally, the, let's say today the work Feta QA was presented, which is a great work. But is blue the right metric to evaluate on that data set? Uh, given uh, you might have picked the right row, but you might just hallucinate one or two tokens M might be the main ones. Right. Uh, but your blue might not show a major drop because uh, I don't know, like instead of two, two, 2000 and 2001, you just produced 2000. So you are just missing one word, the year 2001. Yeah, but that is ma ma the main critical component in that energy output. Right, the knowledge selection piece of it. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. yeah and I, it, they should be able because, like, my understanding is that each annotation act also includes which cells are, are relevant. Right. So they yeah, should be able right. to report uh, a metric that only addresses that. Right. By, by the way, there was there was a metric uh, defined specifically for table to text generation tasks um, by I, think, uh, uh, I, I forget the name of the. I think Bhuvan Degra was one of the authors. The metric was probably parent or parenthesis. And maybe it, it can be repurposed uh, for the same task that uh, Feta QA is doing uh, yeah. to evaluate against things like hallucination and uh, like any other spurious information. All right. Um, all right, moving to modeling. Um, I guess one question that resonated with me quite a bit is like, do we actually think that transformers is all what we need for modeling structured knowledge and just like figure a way to linearize your structured data? Like for example, uh, I think Scott's uh, my understanding of the way Scott's, like in Scott's work, uh, they represented as like a sequence of tokens that represent the structured data and each token will be encoded. But then once it's encoded, it's a sequence of, you know, it's a sequence of tokens. And, uh, you know, it's, it seems like perfect fit for transformers. We don't have to worry about how we actually Design a, uh, a model structure that uh, learned like that makes it easy that ben makes it easier to have inductive bias so, on this kind of so, data. So it depends like how nested or how tree-ish your structured context is. If these are just uh, triplets which have no structure to each other, like just the the only structure is that uh, subject-object predicate, uh, then probably transformer is fine. But if it is a thing like uh, more structured that there's a bigger node and then it has smaller nodes inside it. Uh, so there you might need to capture structure in something by doing something more. I mean, again, adding bracket does convey the structure, so to say, uh, in your linearization. If you, you can linearize it into a tree with brackets, so that would convey the structure. Uh, but yeah, not sure. I mean, given the work our intern did recently, it, it did help adding structure like inductively bias uh, like inductively biasing the model for specific structure between table and text but yeah at a broader level i'm also not sure are you referring to tapas 
yeah yeah so he added uh, inductive biases which were like which are generic inductive biases uh, for between table and text but still there there are like 13 attentional parameters for different things like uh, cell to row header cell to co column header uh, sorry cell to column header and cell, uh, like like so different things which might be required to solve any table to text task so but these were like specific attention biases yeah yeah so which kind of lends this good structural property to on top of tapas model so in addition to account kind of the structural um, nature of that the structured data another thing that I, I think might influence whether transformers are able to model this information uh, accurately is like maybe the type of words that we, we use so maybe like names um, like company names okay except very well-known companies um, so those might not be actually accurately like because the model probably hasn't seen it enough. So this means that uh, for those kind of like longer tail uh, entities, uh, it might be dif more difficult for um, like transformable architectures to to kind of learn. And I think I've seen some work uh, that tries to solve this problem by combining. Uh, I either ensembling or combining um, a transformer with some form of graph neural networks, like graph convolution networks, graph um, neuro, uh, graph uh, GNNs and GCNs, for example. And those can kind of like capture some structural um, dependencies between um, uh, like entities. Uh, like, and those might in sometimes be more effective than just using transformers. So I think it depends on the nature of the task that we are, we are trying to do as well. Uh, right. I think the question is more, uh, we definitely need to convey the structure, but just conveying it in the input to a general transformer model is fine. Or do we need spe specific uh, model 